everybody. Um, thanks to NAC, the organizers, Dr. Bud Kukul and Elizabeth Robichaud for uh, organizing this. Um, this is, I can now share my screen and get to the stuff that I was supposed to at least start out with. Um, this is the cue me on those things. Uh, so firstly, thanks to Dr. Andy Lieberman for his uh, years on the Neuropath Core Steering Committee. He's done a lot of wonderful work. Thank you, Andy. Uh, congrats to Ann McKee, Dr. Ann McKee, for rotating in his chair this upcoming year, and also to Andy Take for coming in. We're looking forward to his tenure on the committee and working together. Now, as everybody knows, the year 2020 has been an utterly great and fantastic year. Uh, but, but seriously, despite all the headwinds, the Neuropath cores have been very busy and ticking down some of the highlights from the steering committee's perspective, uh, the Neurobiobank uh, pilot project that Dr. Silverberg talked about this morning uh, and Dr. Uh, Keen is helping to spearhead is the efforts to enable more folks to not signed up explicitly for ADC cohorts to nonetheless have brain autopsies and contribute to research in the field. Uh, we may in the future be holding a webinar with more related detailed neurobiobank uh, information and, and discussion of the um, pilot project results. Uh, the Digital Neuropathology Committee, headed by Dr. Brittany Duggar and Dr. Melissa Murray, has been very busy. And based on the insights and polling uh, you all participated in, Drs. Duggar and Murray produced an abstract paper, plans have been very busy, and I think there's going to be a lot of future growth in this area of digital neuropathology. Another ADRC associated neuropathology team has worked on a new brain oriented biospecimen best practices guidance document led by Dr. Glazier at Indiana and again by Mayo's uh, Dr. Murray. You all also saw the tissue research uh, resource locator data and website by Marilee Talen and Mac. Uh, I'd like to send a shout out to Dr. Matthew Frosch on the upcoming publication of the project he led on possible propagation of commonly misfolded proteins. That's going to be out soon in JNEN. Um, and with that, uh, this is what we're going to be talking about in our virtual meeting today. Uh, this session is dedicated to how we go about line diagnosing and perhaps standardizing our autopsy reports, including RTAG and other challenging and or mixed diagnoses. And of course, we are all excited to hear from Dr. Gabor Kovac on his keynote talk, which will be about RTAG, and also to hear Dr. McKee talk about the new uh, NAC neuropathology data fields related to RTAG. Now, uh, Elizabeth, before we begin, we have these relevant poll questions because we're on Zoom, we can do poll questions. Let's see if we can do this. Um, two questions. The first question is only for neuropathologists. So this is a poll question for neuropathologists only. Elizabeth, can you help me with this? What am I supposed to do now? So it's only for neuropathologists. How important is it to standardize neuropathologic diagnoses? Neuropathologists, click one of these things. So the hosts and panelists cannot vote. I just tried to vote, tried to stack the vote, but I was unable to do so. And the FBI would have been on me like white on rice, you know that. Okay, we're gonna give you five or 10 more seconds and we're gonna report this at, at the end of the meeting. This is only neuropathologists. How important is it to standardize neuropathologic diagnoses? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, uh, next question. Paul, question number two. Oh, <clears throat> just a minute. All right, all right. It's hard being trendy. We're like trendy poll doers. It ain't easy being trendy. Now, now at the end of this, uh, Elizabeth is going to during the meeting give me. Um, the results and I will show them at the end. But this is for the non-neuropathologists. This is only non-neuropathologists. Neuropathologists do not answer this question. The question is actually the exact same question. How important is it to standardize neuropathologic diagnoses? This is for the non-neuro, no, oh, this is the, that was question number one. I can't, I'm sorry, Pete, I can't get it to, uh... 
All right, we will come up to that question number two later on at some <clears throat> specified moment, but we can turn that off for now. So don't worry, no problem. Okay, we'll present the summary results such as we can get them later. Um, thanks for those who participated. Uh, we, may, you know, we may go over a little bit today. Uh, we have extra time at the end, so we shouldn't panic about timing, but we'll try to keep to our slots. However, the, we, we do have time later in the afternoon to keep on going. It's not going to magically stop at the end of our uh, allotted time because, as you can see on the agenda here, um, we do have uh, no other meetings after us, and it's not going to stop at 2.45. Um, automatically. So today's virtual conference session is dedicated to the question about how we go about line diagnosing autopsy reports in this complex new age of neuropathology, focusing on individual cases and sometimes challenging autopsy diagnostic scenarios. There is a supply and a demand here. Before getting further into what we neuropathologists supply, we'll get insights into demand, i.e. the people who actually read our autopsy reports with a big thank you to Dr. Liana Apostolova, a neurologist from Indiana University who's coming to us all the way from uh, Europe where she is traveling, yet she's still tuning in and helping us today. She's giving us a clinician's perspective. This is part of a push for multidisciplinary, multi-core integration, and I want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Nina Silverberg for encouraging it. And with that, uh, Dr. Apostolova, please take it away and I'll stop sharing and let you go. Thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Pete. I'm really delighted to be with here for all the way from Europe, but I wanted to chime in a little bit about how important it is that we convey the right message to the families in the backdrop of a very complicated um, neuropathological landscape and it's getting more complicated by the minute. Uh -huh. um, all right, so the diagnostic process, how do we do it? It's very, very simple. I'm just going to gloss over that because many of you are so familiar with it. But when we see a new patient, what we would do is we would get a very detailed history, including family history. We'll do a very detailed neuro exam and we'll screen them cognitively in the office with typically a shorter battery than a, uh, the detailed neuropsychological testing initially. Um, this would be followed for those who have objective cognitive decline by laboratory assessments and a structural imaging. We prefer MRI over CT. Um, and then if needed, we will acquire also detailed neuropsychologist testing and additional workup. Based on the HPI and the cognitive data and neurologic exam, we formulate our differential diagnosis and we follow by and large the published criteria. And these are, this is a list of those criteria for those of you that are not fully familiar with them, the NIAAA criteria for MCI and dementia or the Dubois criteria. The, for AD variants, we tend to use the Crutch criteria for PCA and the gordner tempini criteria for lipopenic variant PPA. For FTD, one can use the Neary or the Lund Manchester criteria for DLB and McKeith criteria and so on. What is important is to rule out other etiologies that might be responsible for at least part or the whole of, it, of cognitive decline, such as depression, hypothyroidism, vitamin B12 deficiency, end organ failure, NPH, subdural, toxic encephalopathy, HIV, syphilis as appropriate, and many more. And of course, part of those depend on get us getting an MRI. And the MRI could be very helpful in terms of giving us an idea of what the underlying atrophy pattern is, and, and then we can correlate that with the clinical symptomatology. Oftentimes, they agree quite well. So an amnestic person who presents with an MRI looking like A would be diagnosed most likely with Alzheimer's dementia. Um, the picture in B from the MRI shows a severely atrophic left temporal lobe, which um, goes together with a semantic dementia sort of picture. Frontotemporal dementia is in C. One can see limbic encephalitis in D. Frontal tumor, uh, multilacunar stay, catazole, and new variant CJD with um, hyperintensities in the basal ganglia. So an MRI can be very, very useful. 
but nevertheless is also very nonspecific. Furthermore, mainly the pathology groups and some imaging groups have, have led the field here to uh, determine what type of, what subtypes do we see based on MRI among people with Alzheimer's disease. And um, this is what, what the field looks like now. We have typical AD with global and hippocampal atrophy, limbic predominant with hippocampal atrophy above and beyond the amount of cortical atrophy, hippocampal sparing is the exact opposite. And I have to move the panelists, but yeah, in the last variant listed, um, I cannot read the last variant, I'm so sorry, because the panelists overlay the top of the, yeah. Okay, anyhow, we have more, we have more toys in our chest though, as physicians, for those that meet uh, that meet criteria for Medicare reimbursement, we could obtain an FDG PET scan. Uh, some private insurers also provide uh, funding for that uh, reimbursement. So we could obtain an FDG PET scan. This is a very typical uh, Alzheimer's disease type of FDG PET scan. And for the others, I'm just gonna kind of show you the pictures and show you the different patterns. I want you to kind of think about what these could be. The one on the left versus the one on the right. And here is what those actually are. The one on the left is cortical basal degeneration with much uh, uh, more profound hypometabolism in the left hemisphere, in the right hemisphere compared to the left. And the other one is DLB with profound hypometabolism in the primary visual cortices. And this is another image uh, which goes to the left hemisphere, uh, frontal and temporal lobe. And this is a progressive non-fluent aphasia. And then we also, in recent years, have acquired some tracers that help us determine whether there are specific proteinopathies in the brain, going a little more specific. All the neurodegenerative FDG and MRI are very nonspecific, but here we now finally can have some pathology-like uh, diagnosis, um, and the amyloid PET for tracers are available. NVIDIA is hopefully going to get approved by FDA soon. And then we have the tau pet, and this is some leads data from the longitudinal early onset AD study that Gil Rabinovich and Leo Yacarino have provided. Um, and one can see that in leads, those early onset cases, we see a pattern of typical early onset Alzheimer's with tau binding in the posterior cortical regions, pretty symmetric, some in the front as well. A posterior dominant, dominant EOAD variant, most likely a PCA. Um, then an asymmetric early onset AD, most likely a lobopenic, and some cases that have very mild tau binding as well. All right, so we have amyloid, we have tau, we have neurodegeneration. Now what? But the, the, the problem here is that even within the Alzheimer's disease spectrum, individuals or with the amnestic presentation, even non-amnestic, they can present with any combination of these A, T, and N. Um, um, determinant. So this is uh, a, a very nice um, Venn diagram from Ross Map, showing that among MCI, progressor, stables, progressors, and Alzheimer's disease cases, there's quite a bit of variability. Um, MCI progressors and AD cases, uh, dementia cases, are by and large, the vast majority is A plus, T plus, N plus, but there are others too. So it's already wow. getting complicated. And to add other pathologists to the mix. So on top here, what you see again from Ross Map, a study by Capassi, is that within those diagnosed with probable AD, there is a lot of comorbidity besides AD. These are individuals with Alzheimer's pathology, quite a bit, many of them have vascular pathology, all of them have vascular pathology, and many of them have TDP with or without hippocampal sclerosis, Lewy bodies, in a combination thereof. And then finally, um, probably the most impactful recent publication is the one by Karen that looked at the prevalence in clinical phenotype of quadruple misfolded proteinopathies in older adults. And here I'm presenting percentage prevalence of various combinations of protein deposits among participants with dementia. Those with quadruple proteinopathy are no less but 19.2%. That's about a fifth. It's very common. Those who have tau, A, beta, and TDP43 are nearly 30%. Cases with 
tau, A, beta, and alpha say nucleon are about 21%. Cases with tau, advanced stage, BRAC5 five and five or six, and A, beta, 19.2%. And the other thing is that if we think about within those who show various combinations, all cases, not just the dementia cases, all cases, what is the prevalence of, of individuals with dementia? Those with quadruple proteinopathy, 89.1%. With tau A beta TDP43, 82. Tau A beta alpha synuclein, 62. And tau and amyloid, uh, and it could be any stage of tau, any BRAC stage, 72%. So it's pretty obvious how complicated those cases are under your microscopes. And then the other thing was that 16.9% of cognitively normal participants, those who died with normal cognition, had quadruple proteinopathy. Of, among those who are MCI and had quadruple proteinopathy, those who showed that these four proteins showed faster conversion to dementia. So those who have greater number of proteinopathies have a more aggressive disease, and that's important to know. But does that alone help us clinicians determine that this is not just pure ID, this is more than and how many others in which others in the absence of biomarkers, it's impossible. Pure ID was only seen in 19% of the cases. In terms of late, this is a very famous paper by Pete Nelson. Um, first of all, late is 100 times more common than FTD due to uh, TDP43. Um, the clinical features that are relatively specific to late, but still, do they really help us clinically when we see a patient? Yes, they can kind of guide our thinking, but not everybody with a constellation of these features will have late. So it's a little complicated, but anyhow, late individuals are older, um, they have more gradual cognitive decline and present with more agitation than pure AD. But and when in combination, when TDP43 late and AD is present, present at the same time, the cognitive decline is faster compared to pure AD. In terms of imaging, late cases tend to be more asymmetric, uh, to have more severe hippocampal atrophy and to involve more the anterior portion of the hippocampus, while Alzheimer's involves the anterior and the posterior portion of the hippocampus. And also they could have atrophy or hypometabolism in the medial temporal lobe and the anterior frontal gyrus. How about RTAC? And this is uh, work done by Leah Greenberg's lab. Um, RTAC is extremely common. 64% of autopsy cases out of 83 autopsy cases that they studied showed RTAC. Among amnestic phenotypes, 67% showed RTAC. Among cortical basal degeneration, 43% had RTAG. Logopenics, very mild dementia cases, PCAs, all have 50 plus percent RTAG. How about cognitively normals? They only had three cases, and all three cases showed RTAG. Ranging from late astrophotosy. Next, the LBD spectrum, just only briefly. Um, this is studied by Furman et al. from neurology from this year. So here, what they did is they looked at diagnosis of probable AD with two symptoms out of four, visual hallucinations, fluctuations, Parkinsonism, and RBD, and DLB syndrome, where even one of those symptoms could be present to be called as a DLB syndrome. And they looked at, at um, the presence of tangles, of tau neurofibrillary tangles, and how that impacted the agnostic accuracy for uh, what we find pathologically once we diagnose clinically DLB, probable DLB or DLB syndrome. Without the presence of tangles, physicians were 96% sensitive for probable DLB with diffuse Lewy body. When tangles were present, the accuracy fell to 70% sensitivity. And also the onset of DLB clinical features was later in the disease course. Among those with pure AD pathology, 16% had two features meeting criteria for probable DLB and 22 had one feature meeting criteria for DLB syndrome. But at pathology, they showed pure AD phenotype. 
And this graph depicts how soon individuals with various, uh, with transitional Lewy body dementia or diffuse Lewy body dementia with low, with L the, meaning no, no tau uh, proteinopathy in the brain and H meaning uh, tau neurofibrillary tangles present in the brain and how soon these individuals reach the threshold for being called DLB syndrome or DLB, probable DLB. And you can see that the ones with no tau get to the correct diagnosis much faster. And last but not least, I wanted to present a little bit on early onset AD. This data was shared, is unpublished, soon to be uh, submitted for publication by Leah Greenberg. Um, UCSF has quite the collection of early onset AD cases. And I wanted to show you how that fares compared to late onset cases. Um, we tend to believe that early onset Alzheimer's disease is a pure version of Alzheimer's. Is that so? Um, more so than late, but it's not really a, quite a pure version of Alzheimer's nevertheless. So this, this uh, comparison is early onset versus late and how many proteinopathies are present in the brain of those individuals. Of those with late, only 2% had no um, uh, co-pathology and just pure Alzheimer's disease. And among early onset Alzheimer's disease, 22% had pure Alzheimer's disease. In terms of Lewy bodies, the groups looked fa fairly similar, perhaps actually the early onsets had a, a more significant um, Lewy, pathology burden, Lewy body pathology burden in the amygdala, but overall frequency of Lewy body pathology was similar. In terms, however, of TDP43, of hippocampal sclerosis, argyrophilic grain disease, vascular burden, and RTAG over here, um, late onset cases had significantly more greater prevalence of those proteinopathies compared to early onset cases. So with that, can clinicians accurately predict all concomitant proteinopathies in the absence of biomarkers? We can't. We really can't. So I would advocate that in, case, in cases with multiple proteinopathies, we need to have a formal clinical pathologic consensus conference with pathologists and clinicians present reviewing the clinical data and the pathology data in the context of the clinical data to come up with the, the prominent etiology and then the comorbidities that just happen to be present there and might have contributed to disease severity or some unique features, but the driving pathology can and should be determined for our patients and presented to them in that way. That's it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Apostolova. I appreciate it. And next is Dr. Ann McKee from Boston University to talk about chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So we got you, you're on mute though, Dr. McKee. Okay, sorry. That's the wrong talk. So I have to get the right talk. And can you see that screen now? The diagnosis of CTE? Hello? Yeah, okay. Great, thanks Pete and everybody else for inviting me to do this. Uh, I'm just gonna go through what I consider the, the algorithm of how to diagnose CTE in your cases. Uh, we have had two consensus panels weigh in about this and I think we've got a lot of uh, good practical solutions uh, for people that are looking at cases in, a, in an autopsy brain bank such as the ADRCs. So, uh, the, the, the basic finding of the first uh, consensus panel was that there's a pathognomonic lesion for CTE. Uh, and this lesion is, uh, is uh, defined as an accumulation of abnormally hyperphosphorylated tau in neurons and astroglia distributed around blood vessels at the depths of the cortical sulci and in an irregular pattern. pattern. We had a, a subsequent, a second panel reevaluate that criteria and they made some important refinements in the diagnosis. Uh, for one thing, uh, they determined that a single pathognomonic lesion in the cortex uh, represents the minimum threshold for the diagnosis of CTE. So if you see a pathognomonic lesion in the cortex, 
uh, CTE is diagnosed. And they also made uh, the, the, the important refinements that the PTAU aggregates must be in neurons. So at least some of that collection of, of uh, abnormal cells around the vessel must be neurons. Uh, there may or may not be uh, tau and astrocytes around the vessel, but neurons are a prerequisite. Uh, they are found at the depths of the sulci, around blood vessels, and the committee also uh, made the distinction between uh, very superficial lesions, which are very often uh, our tag that's being misconstrued as CTE. And they said that the pathognomonic lesion had to be deep in the parenchyma, not superficial or subpeel. Now, there are some supportive features of CTE. None of these features are sufficient for the diagnosis. But if you find these things, you more be, may be more suspicious of the diagnosis and may want to do additional sampling. And those supportive features are the presence of superficial layers of NFTs. That's very common in the temporal cortex, also the insula. Um, there's commonly, uh, CTE commonly affects CA2 and CA4. Uh, and often early in the disease, so that may be a distinction with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, CTE affects uh, uh, subcortical and brainstem nuclei, so you're going to see uh, tau in mammillary bodies or some of the other hypothalamic nuclei. You're going to see it in the amygdala, nucleus accumbens, thalamus, midbrain tegmentum, nucleus basalis of minor raphae, uh, substantia nigra, and locus ceruleus. Very commonly, uh, Tau-containing thorn-shaped astrocytes are present in the sub region, but again, their presence is not diagnosed in and of themselves, is not diagnostic of CTE, uh, and uh, you know, so you can't make the diagnosis just based on their presence. And then the, the, the fifth thing that the panel noticed was that very often the neurites in CTE have a dot-like appearance, and that can be sometimes quite striking. Uh, the second pa uh, consensus panel also proposed a working protocol for um, uh, uh, how to work up a case of CTE. Um, and, and first of all, they start with if, if a pathognomonic lesion is present, the diagnosis immediately, as you can see on the left, is CTE. And then you want to determine uh, if it's mild severity CTE or high se or severe severity. We, they, didn't, uh, they didn't go beyond that in terms of uh, the staging. They just made the distinction between what they called low and high CTE. And the distinction between low and high CTE is that in high CTE or severe CTE, there's a spreading uh, that may be cortical from the pathognomonic lesion. You may see tau NFTs in the bank or the crest of the gyrus. Uh, you also may see changes in the hippocampus, especially CA4 and CA1. You may see tau NFTs in the enterorhinal cortex, amygdala, and thalamus. Those are all features of high uh, severity CTE. And you might see uh, tau NFTs or glial tau uh, in the mammillary body or cerebellar dentate nucleus. Uh, and as a proposal from this working group, if five of or more of those features are present, uh, the diagnosis is high CTE, and if it's less than five, uh, it goes as low CTE. They also recommended that in cases that have a high clinical concern, or if there's something suspicious that is uh, tau at the depths of the cell side, but not really with the path perivascular lesion, or maybe you're uh, uh, confronted with a case with a lot of superficial NFTs in the temporal cortex, no A beta, then you want to go back and resample between four and eight cortical cell psi, uh, especially frontal and middle temporal, uh, especially frontal and temporal gyri, uh, uh, to see if you can determine if, if you can uncover a CTE focus. If that is also negative, then it's non-diagnostic for CTE. Uh, and then just to, uh, to reiterate about the distinction from uh, our tag, purely astrocytic perivascular lesions including sub PLR tag, do not meet criteria for CTE. And clusters of tau astrocytes in the white matter, uh, basal ganglia and brainstem are considered R tag and are not uh, specific features of CTE. So I was just going to go through a couple of cases. Hopefully, those will be, um, these will illustrate some of these points. Um, so this is first case a, a football player played for 19 years. Uh, 
youth uh, through NFL. He was doing well through most of his life, except for some attentional difficulties and occasional temper outbursts. He became symptomatic in his late 40s with mild memory complaints in his early 50s. He uh, became forgetful, misplaced objects, had word finding difficulty, uh, but his microcog assessment uh, determined that he was still in the average to average above, above average um, uh, range. He, in, by his late 50s, uh, began repeating himself, getting lost driving. He, at age 61, he was diagnosed with cancer. And at that point, he came in for a neurological evaluation and he was diagnosed uh, with traumatic encephalopathy syndrome possible. And uh, he died that same year. So what we found on brain autopsy was that his brain weighed 1453. And as we found with many of these professional football players, uh, there was still considerable atrophy in the brain despite that fairly um, robust weight. Uh, uh, there was atrophy in the frontal and temporal lobes uh, and as a cavum septum pellucidum. We could see the clear pathognomonic lesions at the depths of the sulci in the superior frontal cortex I'm showing you here, and you can see that at least some of the tau-containing cells are nerve cells or have the profile of neurons. And here again, we have another uh, cell depth lesion, multiple lesions, uh, dorsolateral frontal, and again, the tau appears to be at least uh, somewhat in inside nerve cells. Um, we also found in this case sub PLTSA. Again, not a diagnostic feature, but a very common uh, accompaniment to CTE. In this particular case, there was hippocampal involvement, uh, some in the dentate, but more prominently in CA4 and CA2, and of course CA1. And uh, there were other areas of the brain that had the perivascular, the peripathognomonic lesion. There were superficial tangles in the temporal cortex. Amygdala and enterorhinal cortex were involved. There was no A-beta or alpha-synuclein in the case. Uh, substantia nigra, locus ceruleus had NFT, as well as thalamus and mammillary body. And so this would be a high stage CTE, what we would call at our center stage three, but it would uh, uh, be called by those pro newly proposed uh, workflow, uh, high stage CTE with some sub peel arte. And then for the second case, uh, a slightly older uh, person, a boxer who again had a very long career, nine, 18 years. He retires at 33. Again, he's stable despite some irritability and a quick temper, a gambling addiction uh, until age 66 when he suffers a stroke in the left MCA, but has very little residual uh, uh, impairment from that. At age 71, uh, it, this was the epiphany, the family's epiphany was when he sort of went on, went on a rampage and accused his grandchildren of steal, st stealing his keys and money. He got lost while driving and he re retired from his job in, in government service. At that point, uh, he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and vascular cognitive impairment. He was uh, developed increasing problems in orientation, memory, verbal fluency, visuospatial function, judgment, reasoning, and problem solving. And by the age of 74, uh, only uh, scored a 10 out of 30 on the MOCA. He was started on Aricept and Amenda. Uh, by age 76, he's unable to remember his children's name. He has urinary and fecal incontinence. His MOCA uh, goes down to three out of 30 and he dies at the age of 78 from congestive heart failure. So his brain is very reduced in size. It's 991 grams. There's severe atrophy of the frontal and temporal lobes, as well as a global atrophy. You can see on the, the, the gross that there's ballooning of the hypothalamic floor. The, the mammillary bodies look flattened. Uh, there's also apparent uh, widening of the third ventricle. This is a very common appearance of CTE. Uh, we always look at this region uh, when we're uh, uh, dissecting a case to see if it, it, these criteria are present. Uh, there was also a very large cavum with uh, perforations. It's, you can see it here and this gives you a better idea of the atrophy. And when we looked uh, microscopically, one of the features of this case was that there was severe neuronal loss and gliosis. It was uh, widespread throughout the brain. It was most severe in the frontal and temporal lobes. It was very marked in the medial temporal lobe and nucleus accumbens. 
uh, and there was also severe uh, degeneration of the white matter. When we saw, when we looked for the, the perivascular lesions, we did see them. And you can see here that there's some sub PLTSA, but we do have the pathognomonic lesions. They're not quite as striking in this case with a lot of gliosis, but they are present. Uh, and and uh, one thing I wanted to draw your attention to is in these cases with a lot of neuronal loss and gliosis, commonly in the pathognomonic lesion, we start to see very thickened sort of club neurites with not, without clear cell body or nerve tangle staining. We see a lot more astrocytic uh, pathologies in these, in these lesions, but uh, the, 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 the neuronal loss and gliosis does appear in a way to remodel the lesion in a way that we get these very thick processes that are staining and it has a sort of different uh, cellular pattern. This is showing his very severely affected medial temporal lobe. Uh, they're not apparent in this Bilshowski. I couldn't find the, the one that was better, but he had, he, it, was walt, it was packed with ghost tangles. So this wasn't hippocampal sclerosis. This was very severe neurofibrillary tangle formation with uh, neuronal loss. There was a little bit of AT8 in the hippocampus, um, but not a lot. There was, it was also in the amygdala and the entorhinal cortex. We saw ATA throughout the uh, subcortical structures like thalamus, mammillary body, and we saw it in distant parts of the brain that we don't usually see affected until late in the course of CTE, like the cerebellar dentate nucleus basis pontus. Now, um, like, we, like uh, Liana was mentioning, we also saw TDP43 in this case. It's mostly neuritic, sparse neurites amygdala, frontal cortex, as well as the hippocampus. We did see some A-beta plaques and some mild uh, conchophilic angiopathy. It was mostly diffuse plaques, but we did rate it as having sparse neuritic plaques. And uh, there were changes of RTAG, uh, both the subependymal and white matter RTAG, as well as the sub-PLTSA. So this is a diagnosis, again, of high CTE. Um, uh, we would have graded it stage four. It also has concomitant Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we would rate that intermediate likelihood. I believe late is present, uh, and we can discuss that later, whether or not, because we very commonly see TTD43 in these high stage CTE cases. Is that uh, part of the CTE or is that a different uh, disease entity such as late? Um, we did see the infarct and vascular disease there was cerebellar degeneration, which was not tau-based, and there was Arte. And so uh, those, are, those are what I would consider the key points to consider uh, when you're looking at a brain and trying to decide if CTE is present. So thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for that very much, Dr. McKee. If you could unshare your screen, I'd appreciate it. And we will be asking you some questions later, possibly. Um, and but next we go to Dr. Gabor Kovacs, who comes to us to talk about RTAG. Uh, and this is a, um, a sort of a segue also will be to his keynote presentation later about RTAG. Uh, but for now, um, uh, turn it over to you, Dr. Kovacs, to talk about cases and how we diagnose them. So good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So I will use the privilege that I have a second presentation later so pretty soon so in this uh, presentation practically i just want to show you three cases with clinical and neuropathological uh, data and just show you how i wrote the report and all the background and the complexity you will hear in about uh, 30 minutes so let me show you the first case which is a 77 year old gentleman who had uh, intellectual deterioration for around two years prior to death. And uh, he did not recognize his wife, lost his way on the streets, but the personal hygiene and the eating habits were not changed. And clinical examination concluded that this is compatible with an Alzheimer's dementia, but the two years rapid progression was a kind of a, a, a note. And at that time they made only a CT examination, which revealed a moderate temporal lobe atrophy without any focal atrophy or focal lesions. And finally, after rapid progression, there was some stiffness, but due to Haldor therapy and he described uh, he, he before death. 
And the uh, leading pathology was uh, Alzheimer disease related uh, pathology. So here on the left, you see a scanned image of the hippocampus with uh, phosphatau staining. And on the right, you see a uh, amyloid beta pathology, which affects uh, the CA subiculum region, but also here the inferior temporal gyros. And this is a cortical area, more specifically the inferior temporal gyrus, where in a small area you see some uh, thorn shaped astrocytes uh, in the white matter. And in the same case, in the subependymal region in the inferior horn, there was few, but really only a few thorn shaped astrocytes. But interestingly, there were no TSAs, no thorn shaped astrocytes in the RTAG, which also highlights the situation that. Uh, supial uh, RTAG is not in everybody, so it can be kind of uh, different in other regions. And in addition, this individual did not have hypocampal sclerosis, but did have phosphatidp 43 pathology. On the left, you see uh, amygdala with neuronal staining, and on the right, you see the typical uh, fine uh, thread-like pathology in the cornuammonis of the hippocampus, which is kind of thought to precede the uh, hippocampal sclerosis. So in this case, the neuropathological diagnosis obviously was uh, dominated by the Alzheimer change, which is an end stage practically. There was uh, late also diagnosed and following the staging by Pete Nelson and group, uh, we diagnosed stage two because it affected the amygdala and hippocampus, but not yet the frontal neocortex. And the RTAG was pretty mild and localized, so it was only in the medial temporal lobe, abbreviated here as MTL, white matter, and subependema. So this is how I sign out the case. And with this case, I want to show you how to sign out or how I report the case where the RTAG is not really a prominent uh, feature. And this is uh, the image taken from the uh, consensus paper from 2016, which uh, shows the steps of how to evaluate RTAG. And obviously, first step is to recognize the types, like whether it is supia, subependima, gray matter, white matter, or perivascular and just provide a general overview or a feeling where it is, which major anatomical regions are involved. And we proposed four major regions like the MTL, which is the medial temporal lobe, then the lobar, which means the frontal, parietal, eventual occipital. Subcortical means the basal regions under the basal ganglia or basal ganglia itself, third uh, ventricle, thalamus, and brainstem is brainstem. Then the step three would be to uh, describe the severity. And this was the major issue, and I will touch this in my presentation soon, why it's so difficult to describe the severity. Practically, it's very difficult to follow the mild, moderate, severe, what we usually use in semi-quantitative scoring. So it's, it seems that it's easier or better to say whether you see occasional astrocytes interpreted in the frame of RTAG or you see numerous. And if numerous, do you think that this is focal? or it is really widespread throughout the region. And if you have capacity, you have money, or you have research ideas, then of course it is recommended to do a full and nice anatomical mapping. So this was a case with relatively small amount of art. Again, let me show you a kind of an opposite to this story. And I present an 84 year old uh, lady who suffered from a rectal cancer and uh, metastasis, but not in the brain. And she took care of herself, but she attempted suicide and there was some late onset depression detected. And after she attempted the suicide with benzodiazepines, she survived a couple of days in the hospital. And that time she communicated with the nurse, but there was no neurological or psychiatric examinations performed systematically. And suddenly the brain was a pretty, pretty big surprise. And I'll show you the photos. So this is the amygdala and the tau pathology here will be reflected by 88 phospho tau immunoreactivity. So this is the amygdala, the white matter. And here you see massive amounts of thorn shaped astrocytes, but you see also that the gray matter area of the amygdala and let's move into the amygdala 
where practically it is full and what you see here are all astrocytes except a couple of neurons which I tried to, I don't know if you see my arrow, but there's only a few astrocytes and let's move forward to the hippocampus where the dentate gyrus contains a lot of uh, these uh, astrocytic uh, tau immunoreactivity and even the anterina cortex where you would expect uh, uh, neuronal tau pathology shows also uh, astroglial accumulation. And let's move to the basic ganglia where the nucleus accumbens show this uh, uh, relatively lot of uh, astrocytic uh, profiles. And even the claustrum, which is a wide matter area between the insular cortex and the basal ganglia, again contained astrocytes. Let's go to the uh, anterior cingulate. And this is the wide matter and this is the gray matter. So you see these clusters all over the cortical, but also the white matter. And then moving to the temporal white matter, you see these big plaque-like accumulations of uh, thorn-shaped astrocytes. And let's go to the brainstem. And here, this is the substantia nigra, where you see also only astrocytic profiles. And this case was pretty unusual because the phosphotdp 43 was also abundant in this case. And these are the neuronal ones on the IJKL image, but also you, we recognize astrocytic-like immunoreactivity profiles. And moving to the alpha synuclein, the patient had a massive uh, synuclein pathology to BRAC stage four, and here is an example of the locus seroleus on the left and on the right, the amygdala, again showing astroglial protein accumulation. So. This is a general overview of this mapping. And of course, we don't need to go into details because this is a kind of a research summary. But uh, this shows that you will see patients or cases with unexpected amounts of astroglial tau and eventually other proteins. So this case had a low um, uh, stage and uh, tau phase had cerebral amyloid angiopathy, had Lewy body pathology, had TDP43, which according to the Joseph's uh, classification would be an, uh, an early transition stage to six. But according to the late classification, we would still keep the stage two because the frontal gyrus itself was not involved. And uh, multiple system, I, I, I gave the diagnosis multiple system attack of all types because practically it would take like two pages to list all of these if I would follow the ARTAG uh, paper recommendations. So uh, I just noted in the report that this is a numerous widespread medial temporal lobe, lobar, subcortical and brainstem ARTAG of all types. And then of course, for a scientific report, this can be summarized in uh, uh, details. And finally, a third case uh, before my lecture is that an 80-year-old man with clinically classical features of Alzheimer's disease, 10 years long, uh, pretty textbook case, but the last year some kind of gait imbalance was noted. And in addition to the Alzheimer pathology, which I will not show here, in the pariatal cortex, there were very, only a focal supial, but not in the depth of the sozi, and also small and practically only a, a focal uh, astrocytic uh, immunoreactivity and in the same white matter also some. The brainstem contained in the pyramids, the medullary pyramids, an asymmetric accumulation of white matter uh, thorn-shaped astrocytes. So in this case, the neuropathology report consisted of, or focused on the description of the Alzheimer-related pathology and the ARTAG was described as lobar supial, lobar gray matter, and lobar white matter. And because it was seen only in a small area, it was the occasional, which maybe you would prepare, prefer the word mild, but this is occasional and not numerous. But in the brainstem white matter, it was numerous and widespread. And that there was also occasional perivascular. So this is my uh, presentation for, for now. And uh, I will go into more details and background in my keynote lecture. Thank you very much. Great, thanks kindly, Dr. Kovac. And next up is Dr. Dixon to be talking about uh, the many cases that have combinations of uh, Alzheimer's disease and sunnucleinopathy and whatever else you want to talk about.
I want to unmute myself. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, let's start. So what are the Lewy body disorders? I, the most common Lewy body disorder is actually Parkinson's disease. And this is not something that most AD centers um, are involved in uh, studying, but uh, occasionally uh, patients get enrolled in Alzheimer's centers that have predominantly a motor syndrome. Um, the Parkinson's, uh, Parkinsonism is related to nigrostriatal dopamine degeneration, but there are a lot of non-motor manifestations as well. Um, one of the end stages of the disease process is a dementia syndrome. And this is referred to as Parkinson's disease dementia. We like to think of this as sort of a bottom-up progression of Lewy body pathology, where it starts in uh, lower brainstem areas, or maybe even in peripheral autonomic nervous system, and then progresses through dorsal motor, locus soleus, nigra, basal forebrain, limbic, and, and then maybe at the very end stages, there's some involvement of primary cortices. The, uh, the other um, type of disorder that is more likely to be seen in Alzheimer's centers is dementia with Lewy bodies. You could think of this as a very different disease progression because they don't necessarily have Parkinson's uh, or Parkinsonism. And uh, I think of this as more of a, of a, a, a top-down in a sense. It's actually spreading in, in, in a, a, a top-down, but also in a, in a sort of a uh, upward progression as well, with the primary locus being in the limbic areas. And you might put the olfactory system here as well, um, where um, brainstem involvement is much less common and primary cortex is less common. And uh, depending on the areas that are affected, it, it uh, drives the clinical presentation, um, including things like psychosis, delusions, hallucinations, uh, uh, or Parkinsonism or sleep disorder. And then, but the most common uh, Lewy body disorder that um, is seen in Alzheimer's centers is, are Lewy bodies that are uh, and seen in Alzheimer's disease in predominantly the amygdala, pretty, this is ALB. And then occasionally Lewy bodies are seen in, uh, in normal controls. Uh, they're usually not associated with neuronal loss, they're usually low density, and actually primarily in a Parkinsonian distribution, so a brainstem predominant distribution. So Lewy bodies can be seen with routine histologic methods um, as a eosinophilic or hyaline inclusion in, in brainstem, so the brainstem Lewy bodies. Cortical Lewy bodies are more subtle with routine histology, but immunohistochemistry for synuclein is a sensitive and specific method for detecting all types of Lewy body pathology, including the neuritic pathology that's not visible with routine histologic methods. So I mentioned that the Parkinsonism it, uh, it correlates with this nigrostriatal degeneration, and that can be appreciated by actually looking at the dopaminergic nerve termini with the tyrosine hydroxylase. We see a marked uh, decrease in the nerve termini in the striatum in um, uh, patients that have uh, overt uh, substantia nigra neuronal loss. In terms of the, the neuropathologists and their role in, in diagnosing PD, um, PD is a clinical diagnosis, but I think uh, pathologists should make an effort to try, to try to determine whether the pathology that they observe would be compatible with a clinical diagnosis of PD. And the way to do that is to assess the severity of the substantia nigra neuronal loss with a particular focus on the ventral lateral uh, tier of neurons. Um, as illustrated here in these uh, diagrams and photomicrographs from Glenda Halliday. Um, so the the diagnosis of PD should involve ventrolateral neuronal loss in the substantia nigra pars compacta. And um, it has to be in, um, to in the moderate to severe to be uh, associated with a Parkinsonian clinical syndrome. And there have to be Lewy bodies um, if you want to diagnose Parkinson's disease and not some other uh, atypical Parkinsonian disorder. The synuclein pathology has been um, best uh, studied and most thoroughly studied in terms of distribution by Heiko Brock and, and his team. And he proposed the six stages of progression of the synuclein pathology, which uh, begins in the med medulla uh, and actually begins in two places, the olfactory bulb or the medulla. And uh, so the, the typical Parkinson patient is more of a medulla upward to locus soleus, midbrain, medial temporal lobe, and eventually um, higher order cortical areas with a relative or complete sparing of primary uh, motor and sensory cortices. 
the uh, pr first person to propose a staging scheme or a classification of lunar disorders was Kenji Kosaka. And um, we sometimes refer to diffuse Lewy body disease actually as Kosaka's disease. And it, 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 it's a simplification of Brock's uh, neuroanatomical classification in terms of brainstem, transitional or limbic and diffuse. Uh, and you can see how the Kosaka maps to the Brock stage. Because there's more um, granularity in the Brock staging scheme, it's uh, prone to um, lower interrater reliability, whereas the more simplified scheme is, um, I think, has higher interrater reliability. And in, in the uh, consortium for DLB actually adopted the Kosaka uh, simplified classification of brainstem, transitional, or limbic, um, and diffuse Lewy body disease. And the initial uh, proposal, uh, when the, the first report of the DLB consortium used ubiquitin, but then um, in around 1997, synuclein was discovered, far more specific, far more sensitive and specific. And um, so the, in 2005, the, the um, criteria recommended using synuclein and it recon re uh, recommended a quantitative approach. In other words, actually, you can look in as, um, and score it as mild, moderate, severe, and very severe, or you can, and I think many people do this, I know I do, the models that were given, you actually count the number of Lewy bodies that were illustrated in the mild, moderate, severe to actually determine um, what would you consider a mild or moderate, severe. And these are images that were taken at, at about an intermediate magnification, so about a 20, uh, 200 fold, or 200X magnification. I wanna just point out some things that that I think are important to realize that it is actually possible in a brainstem predominant Lewy body disease to have a very small number of Lewy bodies in limbic areas. And this is not sufficient to classify it as a, a limbic or transitional Lewy body disease. And um, in transitional Lewy body disease also can have cortical Lewy bodies. And the fact that you have some Lewy bodies in uh, temporal cortex, especially superior temporal gyrus is not enough to call it diffuse Lewy body disease. So diffuse Lewy body disease should have, be, have involvement in frontal and parietal areas. And this is how, if you do Lewy body counts and look at about 900 cases of Lewy body disease, how it breaks out. You see the brainstem cases do in fact occasionally have limbic Lewy body disease or even uh, involvement of superior, superior temporal, but they, they're sort of below this threshold of at least five Lewy bodies. And the transitionals may have Lewy bodies in, uh, especially the, the temporal, but frontal and prior, are, it's uncommon and they're below the threshold, whereas diffuse has significant Lewy bodies in all areas. Um, so the other uh, iteration of this in 2016, or 2017 rather, was that the pathologists try to make uh, an effort to predict whether the patient would have had the classic Lewy body dementia clinical syndrome. And that required um, uh, taking into account uh, both Alzheimer pathology and Lewy body pathology with the recognition that the greater the Alzheimer pathology, the less likely that the person would have had a clinical syndrome of DLB. Um, and so it's, uh, even if you have diffuse Lewy body disease, if you have significant uh, neurofibrillary tangles, and this, uh, I appreciate Leanna's uh, presentation where she pointed out that it's tangles, it drives this, uh, uh, the clinical association. I think Oscar Lopez was one of the first in the work from Pittsburgh to emphasize that in fact, Brock neurofibrillary tangle trumps um, Lewy bodies when it comes to clinical presentation. If you have significant Alzheimer neurofibrillary tangles, those patients do not present as Lewy body dementia, they present as Alzheimer's. And so th this is the, the matrix that you have to try to um, uh, navigate when you're trying to develop a clinical path diagnosis. Here's an example of a patient with uh, 81-year-old 80, with six-year progressive cognitive impairment. Man, many clinical features of Lewy body dementia, which, such as fluctuations, misidentifications, REM sleep behavior disorder, and um, Parkinsonism. And the neuropsychology profile uh, fit with um, the sort of de deficits that you see in Lewy body dementia. There's kind of a combination of a frontal subcortical and an amnestic, and this patient was clinically thought to be DLB. Um, the pathology, you examine the, the uh, cellular pathology with hem hematoxin eosin, focusing on what I like to look for is spongiform change. 
in limbic areas such as the neuronal cortex or especially the amygdala. I would like to see nucleus basalis of Maynard neuronal loss at least mild. And then whether or not there's Parkinsonism, you want to see at least moderate to severe migral neural loss. If there's significant Alzheimer pathology, the locus ruis will also have significant neural loss. And the, depending on the degree of Parkinsonism, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus will also have neural loss. Now I've been using thioflavin for 35 years, actually over 35 years to assess Alzheimer pathology. It's fast, it's inexpensive, and very sensitive to all types of Alzheimer type pathology. The pale plaques, the dense cord neuritic plaques, and to neurofibular tangles, as well as amyloid angiopathy. And so in this particular case, um, we actually stopped counting plaques at 50 because it, uh, when we were doing this at uh, the, the time of the catch turing criteria, 50 was more than twice the number of plaques needed to reach criteria. So if there's 50 or more, um, we basically stop, uh, stop counting. And so you can look at the distribution of tangles in frontal temporal parietal and then a couple of primary cortices as well. I think it's important to include primary cortices because they kind of anchor your, your, um, your um, pathologic measures. And then we look at plaques and tangles in the, um, in the hippocampus and count Lewy bodies. And this is an extreme case. This is a really remarkable density of Lewy bodies in the cortex. You can see there was some immunohistochemistry in the severe temporal, very high density of Lewy bodies. Um, and we also look at Lewy bodies in brainstem uh, and basal forebrain regions. And if the olfactory bulb is present, I encourage you to submit this as well. Um, uh, we usually try to take cross sections of the olfactory bulb so that the anterior olfactory nucleus is well sampled in the middle of the bulb uh, and the plexiform layers around the periphery. So this is this patient. He's a diffuse Lewy disease. He has Alzheimer type, type pathology, BRAC5, BAL5, CEREB moderate, and he's intermediate. So what do you do with your NAC form? This is what you do with your NAC form. You fill it out, and what's missing from that is this. What's the likelihood that this person actually had a DLB clinical syndrome? And given the fairly significant degree of Alzheimer's pathology, even though the Lewy body pathology is really severe here, he would only be considered an intermediate likelihood DLB um, because the, uh, um, the tangles trump the Lewy bodies. Any questions? If not, We'll move on to our next. I think we're going to put questions next uh, after uh, Dr. Seeley's uh, um, talk. And so if I'm going to begin then. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dixon. Appreciate that. Uh, this this one is going to be about late. Uh, the term late is uh, for limbic predominant age related TDP 43 encephalopathy. Uh, the late NC has the, is discussing the neuropathologic change rather than the disease itself, following the convention of Alzheimer's disease, neuropathologic change. I'm going to discuss the results for uh, two research volunteers followed from normal cognitive status at the University of Kentucky. Uh, spoiler alert, the first one is late without comorbid ADNC, and the second one is late NC with comorbid ADNC. So case one, this is somebody that was APOE33, enrolled at age 77 for the longitudinal cohort. Um, you can show the contours of her cognitive um, status, uh, the global cognitive status uh, as determination uh, determined by the mini mental state exam scores. So it's a zero to 30, this is age 77. You can see that she started going down around age 90. MCI was diagnosed at age 92. Um, and AD at age 97. What about the uh, clinical signs and, and symptoms? She had memory loss. Uh, she had uh, impairments of activities of daily living with a clinical dementia rating score of two. So she was quite impaired, but not end stage necessarily. Um, the pertinent negatives is that there was no aphasia, no language disturbance at all, no disinhibition, no appetite disturbance, no motor symptoms, so no features that would you would really associate with a frontotemporal uh, dementia clinical syndrome. In terms of her MRI, this was the what she got at uh, the transition from normal to MCI at the age of 92. Uh, you can see here, um, uh, particularly here, the medial temporal lobes were uh, absolutely hammered, um, and she also had 
um, some indication of uh, white matter hyperintensities for indicated small vessel ischemic disease. Uh, autopsy results had no A beta at all, none. No Lewy bodies, no large infarcts. There was part, you can see the P tau that was uh, focused in the uh, hippocampus, and there was also uh, TDP43 proteinopathy. Uh, here you see it in the dentate granule cells, here you see it in CA1 of the hippocampus. Uh, what about outside the hippocampus? We also saw it in a number of other places, including the middle frontal gyrus. Uh, here is the most severely affected area of the middle frontal gyrus. Uh, it's nothing to write home about. More representative is here. It's even uh, more uh, sporadic uh, immunoreactivity for phospho-TDP. So this is um, uh, gets to the question of how we, we stage it. Um, the, the, con the group that got together to discuss this came up with a, a three-term staging for it, where one, stage one is amygdala only, stage two is amygdala plus hippocampus, and stage three uh, also include the middle frontal gyrus. This group did not do the work. This is not, this is just a catabolism, a simplified system based on the work of Keith Josephs and colleagues, including Dennis Dixon at Mayo in 2013 and 2016, and a related staging system by Sue Nag and Julie Schneider and their, their colleagues in 2017 at Rush. Their system is a little bit more complicated. The reason that we went with the simplified staging scheme really are three. The first was touched on by Dennis in his talk was that a simplified scheme has better inter-rater reliability. The second reason is that there's not a known reason in clinical pathological correlation to solidly say why there should be a more uh, complicated staging system. But the third is that y'all would have killed us for doing more stages. We already have a big burden of economical of both time and effort in terms of uh, how we sample, uh, cut, section, uh, stain, analyze, and report our, our, uh, our diagnoses. And we didn't want it, we wanted to make it as uh, economical as possible for all those things. And for all those reasons, we just had a fairly simplified staging scheme. Uh, in the future, it may change, but for now, that's it. Hippocampal sclerosis is very commonly comorbid with late and it seems to be part of the pathophysiology in some of the cases, but it's neither necessary nor sufficient for the diagnosis. So in this particular case, we uh, diagnosed late stage three because it was in the middle frontal gyrus. Hippocampal sclerosis was present and remarked on. Uh, the part was uh, stage two BRAC, and there was moderate small vessel pathology. Uh, so here's the scenario. We have this person in advanced old age, clinical diagnosis of probable Alzheimer's, at autopsy, it had late with a little bit of tauopathy, no Alzheimer's or Lewy body disease. If you called this, I mean, the question then has arisen, is this an actually an FTD case or is it actually, should it be called something else what we're calling late? Um, if you called this FTD, the, the patients would have gone home and looked up what frontotemporal dementia is and they would have found that absolutely none of the specific features of FTD were associated with this patient, whereas late gives you a second uh, idea, and it's a very important point that this is a common scenario. This is very commonly seen in all community-based cohorts. And what do you, why do we suggest uh, this is not politics, this is science? What's the scientific basis for thinking that there's a, a, a difference between FTLD, TDP, and late? Um, a very recent uh, paper I'd like to highlight, which I think is a really nice example of um, a collaboration between ADRCs. This is a collaboration between uh, Penn and University of Kentucky. And we found that there are very large differences actually in the neuropathology. I recommend people check it out, but cutting to the chase, I'm not gonna get down into the real uh, weeds of the paper. There's a lot of data, a lot of uh, blinded readings from multiple centers, but simple criteria could differentiate FTLD TDP from late with around 98% confidence in two cohorts. And and uh, significantly, one of the cohorts is mostly community-based, the University of Kentucky, and one of the basis of, of this study was a mostly clinic-based cohort, which was University of Pennsylvania, and it shows the versatility of uh, these criteria for differentiating between these two conditions. Next case, case two. So this is another ApoE33, and it's important to note that people with ADNC and people without ADNC their most likely genotype is not ApoE34, which are enriched in dementia clinics, 
the most likely genotype for both of those groups for somebody with ADNC is APOE33. This individual is in, uh, enrolled at age 65. These are the MMSE scores uh, on the left, the y-axis, and the x-axis is age. Um, that person sort of bumped along, had MCI diagnosed at age 80. Alzheimer's disease was diagnosed at age 84. So again, what were the clinical signs and symptoms? There was a profound memory loss. Uh, impairments of daily livings was even more than the prior one. It was a three out of three in the global clinical dementia rating score. This person also suffered from delusions and psychosis and had some language problems because she was really impaired, but there was no aphasia, again, no disinhibition, no appetite disturbance, and no motor symptoms. These are MRIs. Uh, this was 12 years before death. On the left, you can see the coronal, uh, which allows you to appreciate there's some uh, shrinkage of the hippocampus, maybe more here even in the, in the cortex. Uh, a later MRI, and forgive me that these are at somewhat different levels. This was six years before death, but during uh, her dementia status, uh, um, she had an even more shrunken or some interval progression. But you can really actually see better in, the, in this horizontal section that a lot of the damage was already done by the time um, she was in a mild cognitive, so-called mild cognitive impairment. So what about the autopsy reports? So the, the results show very widespread A-beta, very widespread neurofibrillary tangles. So the person was thal, A-beta stage five, a lot of um, A-beta all over the place, including down in the cerebellum, uh, widespread neurofibrillary tangles, including widely out in the neocortical regions. Um, there also was hippocampal sclerosis, as you would have suspected, uh, from the MRI. This is a low power pho photomicrograph h &E showing a very shrunken, uh, shriveled up uh, hippocampus. Uh, there was TDP-43 potinopathy shown here in the hippocampus. It was in the amygdala and the hippocampus. So here we have uh, somebody who's ADNC, Alzheimer's disease neuropathologic change, which is A3B3C3. Uh, the stage two late neuropathologic change uh, was combined with hippocampal sclerosis, and there was again moderate small vessel pathology. And this really gets to the, some of the questions uh, that Liana was talking about, and others have. What do we do with these comorbid pathologies? Do we subordinate the TDP now to the Alzheimer's, or do we put them as separate line diagnoses? This gets to the question of that we're all sort of understand the sort of the, the four horses of the neurodegenerative disease apocalypse, A, beta, tau, alpha synuclein, and TDP. Each of these are sort of associated with a specific disease, but it turns out that a lot of these horses run together in community-based cohorts. You see them together much more than is frequently, appreciate, uh, fre frequently appreciated. Uh, and this gets to the uh, paper uh, that Dr. Apakulava kindly highlighted. It's a uh, project that was um, uh, spearheaded by Dr. Abner and her uh, graduate student, Shama Karant. And I wanted to show you that on the left, we have the folks with dementia. These were mostly all followed from normal cognitive status. And on the right, you see folks with MCI. And I just wanted to highlight that the people with AD plus late were 27.1%. Whereas the people with pure AD were only 19.2%. So that, that's a really important point. This is a very common uh, uh, combination. So is it important to note the late is there in addition to diagnosing the AD? And that's sort of the question at hand. So as you saw with the prior uh, charts that showed the progression of the cognitive changes over time, we follow people for a long time here, and among people that were followed for many years, uh, averaging over a decade, you can see how much they decline over time. And again, this is uh, really not my work. This is that of Dr. Abner and her grad student, uh, Shama Karat. Uh, the, it is, but it's something that not only we are showed, but others, the Rush University just came up with a really nice paper showing essentially the same thing, which is that pure late has a relatively mellow cognitive decline. Pure AD has a more severe cognitive decline, whereas AD plus late is more severe still. So the combination is worse than either in isolation. And then if you get down here, this is where that QMP quadruple misfolded protein phenotype comes in. That's even worse. So it's very, it actually is a worse 
very uh, statistically significantly different, worse uh, clinical trajectory for those with AD plus late as opposed to pure AD or pure late. So in conclusion, wrapping it up, we had these two cases and what did they show? The first one was late without comorbid ADNC. And the things that I want to uh, emphasize is that late without ADNC is not the same thing as FTLD TDP. The neuropathology is different, the age range is different, and the symptoms are different. And it's not some sort of rare zebra. This is at least 10, maybe 20 times more common than FTLD. This is a common clinical pathological entity in clinical and in, in community-based cohorts. So second case has a combination of AD, NC, and late. Uh, it's best to use a separate line diagnosis. And the reason it's best to do that is that AD, NC, pure late, or the combination of the comorbid pathology each has a characteristic and different uh, cognitive uh, symptomatology, and so it actually adds to the, um, the information that's important for the patients and the clinicians to know about. Um, and with that, uh, I'm done. I want to say thank you very much to uh, the neuropath folks here, Sonia Anderson and Ela Patel, uh, to my colleagues, Dr. Donna Wilcock, a biomarker core leader, and Dr. Greg Jaika, clinical core leader, and my boss, uh, uh, Dr. Linda Van Eldick, who runs the ADRC and is a great boss. So with that, I will stop sharing. And I'm going to pass it over to uh, Dr. Bill Seeley, uh, who's going to talk to us about FTLD TDP. You see my uh, uh, presenter view there, Pete? Yes, sir. Got it. Great. So thanks for the invitation to be part of this. Um, it's been a really great session. I think the, the le this last section will complement things you've heard from others. Um, my first slide is just meant to remind us all about the complexity of clinical pathological correlation uh, within the FTD, FTLD spectrum. Um, and as you can see, for some of the disorders, it's uh, more straightforward to make pathological predictions. For others, it's a bit of a, a challenge. Um, my mandate for today is the FTLD TDP43 group, and so uh, I'm going to focus on this, and I would love to be able to sort of walk you through a series of slides, as Ann did for CTE and Pete did for late, where um, I lay out all the consensus diagnostic criteria for each of these subtypes. Unfortunately, that process has yet to occur, uh, and even our NAC forms lack an opportunity to really document the specific subtype for FTLD TDP, um, but uh, I think there's uh, help on the way. So Ian McKenzie, D Dennis Dixon, and I are leading the uh, neuropathology core for all FTD, um, the major multi-center uh, consortium on this set of diseases. And one of our stated aims is to organize an effort on um, consensus uh, criteria for these subtypes, and um, we're hoping to pursue this within the coming year. Um, in the meantime, I've limited my accounting here to the FTLD TDP subtypes that are included in the consensus nosology paper by McKenzie et al. in 2010, but I would be quick to acknowledge that um, there is a new proposed type E uh, by the Penn group. I think it's fair to say that the field is still sort of working through this proposal, and so I'm going to limit my discussion today to these uh, types. So showing now um, the um, pathological spectrum of FTLD, uh, briefly just to say that each uh, major disorder that we diagnose routinely at UCSF uh, has characteristic features and then focusing on the TDP subtypes. In uh, type A, uh, the diagnosis is based on a superficial layer predominant pattern of small, compact, round, crescent-shaped, or curvilinear uh, inclusions in the neuronal cytoplasm. There are also occasional uh, lentiform intranuclear inclusions, but if I'm busy, I might not find one of those in, a, in an entire review of a case, so I, I don't uh, like to emphasize those in the diagnosis. The key is these small, compact, and round inclusions in upper layers, which are accompanied by m many, many small, thin, or thick, kind of multi-angulated neuropil threads, again, also emphasizing the upper layers. That is the characteristic pattern. In type B, the diagnosis uh, is made based on the presence of these very fine, uh, diffuse or granular, almost stippled, some say granulofilamentous uh, neuronal cytoplasmic inclusions um, in neurons. These are seen in both upper and lower layers of cortex and are variably accompanied by a sort of fine, dusty type 
of neuropil uh, thread, almost grain-like pathology, which is, um, I think, variable from case to case, varying from very little to uh, a substantial uh, burden, but not quite like what you'd see in type A. Um, and then type C is the kind of easiest one to diagnose. It's based on these hugely swollen, sometimes thinner, but long dystrophic uh, neurites that sort of hang like a hanging garden through the, the cortex and can be seen in upper and lower layers. Um, here I'm emphasizing the cortical features because I think they're the key to the diagnosis, but the subcortical structures can also be helpful and that's been written about extensively. Um, I was told to talk about cases and how we sign um, cases out at UCSF, so I'm going to move right into a couple of cases that I think will be uh, helpful. Um, so the first is a 55-year-old man whose illness began at uh, age 47. He developed what was a typical BVFTD syndrome uh, for us, um, and then later in his uh, course, progressive weakness and muscle wake, uh, wasting uh, culminating in tetraparesis. So his clinical syndromic diagnosis was BVFTD, and um, uh, family history not contributory. This is his brain, good-sized brain, mild frontal atrophy. We cut these brains into coronal slabs freshly uh, with both hemispheres represented and alternately fix and freeze them. This is what they look like. I'll be coming back to these throughout. You can see the midbrain uh, cerebral peduncles are atrophied. Um, and here we are uh, just getting a survey of some affected areas with uh, superficial spongiosis and in the inferior temporal gyrus, a little bit less prominent in precentral. Here's the spinal cord. You can see that um, in the anterior horn, we have a depopulation of the anterior horn cells, benina bodies, and lower motor neurons that remain. We have uh, corticospinal tract demyelination in uh, anterior and lateral uh, columns, and um, no plaques of any kind in the case. Um, and then the uh, case kind of looks so typical so far. So here we have a, a patient with um, uh, an abundance of these fine, uh, diffusely granular uh, filamentous, uh, granular filamentous inclusions in, uh, in upper and lower layers, uh, type B inclusions. Um, you can see them in the motor cortex as well. Here they are in the spinal cord anterior horn, very classical skein-like and stippled inclusions. Um, they're present in the facial nucleus. We follow the facial uh, nerve in the intrafascicular portion. You can see TDP43 streaking through this portion of the nerve. It's rather beautiful hypoglossal nucleus, full of inclusions. Uh, and then the case takes the right turn. So why am I presenting this case? So he played high school football, had a habit of NMA as an adult, and then um, uh, here's the task. So I can't, I can't present this slide without acknowledging uh, Peter Davies. Um, we've been using his antibodies for a year and he's been a great collaborator and um, uh, the field will miss him dearly. Um, but here's the task. So um, we've got upper layer uh, tangles, we've got a perivascular pattern of neuronal and glial inclusions, um, and so uh, the amygdala and the neuronal cortex are full of tau. There are also uh, uh, astrocyte predominant TSAs and uh, perivascular spaces. You can see those here, uh, reminiscent of our tag, but we've got um, a lot of perivascular involvement here in middle frontal gyrus and the depths of cell side neurons and glia multiple cortical regions involved, doesn't reach to the motor cortex, even though the corticospinal tracts are completely degenerate. And um, uh, our antibody to tau also detects nothing in the um, affected hypoglossal nucleus, uh, even though it's full of TDP. Um, here I'm showing the depth of a sulcus with tau and TDP staying side by side, just a little lacing, kind of fine granular uh, lacing of the tau lesions with TDP in this area. So a couple of pertinent negatives. I'm going to keep it moving, and this, this is how we sign it out. It's an FTLD TDP case because that's got all the features clinically, pathologically, um, and it happens to have CTE. And you know, I think some of the CTE might have even distorted or um, rearranged the way some of the TT, TDP looked like. But it, at UCSF, this is how we would sign a case like this out. Okay, I'm at uh, I guess 10 minutes or so. I, I can stop here, Pete, or I can I can do one more quick one. Your your call. Why don't you do one more quick one? Um, I think people would appreciate it. Uh, we are running a little bit late, and so we're going to have to probably squish the discussion until after um, Gabor and Ann's discussion. But uh, why don't you go ahead and do what, do what you got? That's a quick one. So this is case two, a uh, 76-year-old woman um, with a, a relatively short course of symptoms, started with episodic memory, then executive dysfunction, disinhibition, lack of insight. So a little bit of a blended syndrome with some AD-like and uh, FTD-like features, but later in the course, 
Uh, her decline uh, accelerated. She developed some kind of unspecified motor impairment. This is all reports from caregivers. Um, and she was actually thought to have uh, Alzheimer type dementia as her primary clinical syndrome. Uh, MRI scan shows, uh, again, a blended picture with um, anterior insula, anterior cingulate atrophy, a very small hippocampus bilaterally, but also parietal involvement, amygdala. Um, and the gross pathology really mirrors that, although it's always less prominent than we see on the MRI. Um, and uh, brainstem, uh, also some uh, loss of uh, neurons in the Niagara. So here's the anterior cingulate. It's got an FTLD looking like degenerative pattern in upper cortical layers. Um, here's the hippocampus. It's quite small, but uh, has just focal, um, kind of hyperfocal subicular sclerosis. Just not quite at our threshold for calling it at UCSF. The anterior horn cells are depopulated, very similar to the last case. Uh, here's the TDP43. Okay, looks familiar now. It's a uh, uh, granular filamentous inclusions, dot-like stippled inclusions in, in neurons, an occasional more compact one, but these are really not the defining lesion of this subtype. Um, so looking at this a bit further, um, we have uh, another view of the anterior cingulate higher up uh, in the upper layers and uh, just innumerable inclusions of this type. Um, here I'm in the medial temporal lobe now. Uh, in, the, in the subiculum, which was so sclerotic, we have a scattering of inclusions here. Uh, the dentate gyrus is full of inclusions. You can see this fine dust of synaptic staining and CA4 end plate um, kind of area. And then um, lower motor neurons also involved in much the same way as I showed in the previous case. But here's the right turn for this one. Okay, it's a, it's an, it's a tall five Alzheimer case. So uh, what do we do now? <laughs> is, this, is this late in AD? Or is this a, a TDP of Alzheimer? What do we call this? Um, it's a tall five Alzheimer case. Uh, the the toopathy is quite robust here in the limbic structures, but you can see it reaches all the way to the association neocortex. Uh, it spares the primary cortex, so this is a BRAC stage five. Um, here are the pertinent uh, positives and negatives. Um, but th this is another one, same diagnosis at the top, primary di diagnosis FTLD TDP type B with motor neuron. But we have a co-primary here because the patient has advanced Alzheimer's disease. And so we wouldn't sign this case out as late. We'd call it FTLD TDP with motor neuron. And uh, then the other incidental diagnosis is listed. So I thought that one was a good one to sh show side by side with the first case because we've got two, two situations of some complexity that we have to work through. And that's how we do it um, uh, at, at UCSF. Okay. Awesome. Wonderful, wonderful presentations. Thank you to all the panelists. It's, a, it's very humbling to be um, with such expertise. Um, I think that in order to keep our proscribed agenda, I'd like to then progress to um, Dr. Kovach's uh, keynote presentation, and then we can try to discuss, and if everybody out there wants to ask questions, please do. Uh, we will try to, to get to as many as we can. We'll break, uh, we'll try to say that we'll break by 3.30 or something after uh, EST at the, at the worst, but, and we'll try to address some of them. Otherwise, we can maybe go on the NP listserv or do some other means of discussion, but I don't, I would like to make it so that people know that people are certainly going to be keen to listen to Dr. Kovach's presentation. I don't want to keep them waiting. So, Gabor, if it's okay with you, uh, would you mind going ahead and taking uh, the floor? Well, uh, thank you very much again for this uh, honorful opportunity. I really appreciate it and I will try to be fast and concise. Uh, so these are the objectives of the presentation. So I would like to define RTAG and its types, to present the distribution patterns of different types, to present pot potential pathogenic aspects. I would like to highlight relation to FTLD tau proteinopathies. I would like to address the question of clinical relevance and to finally to prevent, pre present evaluation strategies. As all of you are aware, currently we classify FTLD tau based on the presence or predominance of three repeat, four repeat, or a combination of these two isoforms. These are the diseases where the clinical pathological phenotypes are accepted and relatively established in the literature, in the clinical practice. 
However, uh, recent studies indicate that there is a much, the spectrum of tau immune reactive pathologies go beyond these uh, disorders. Let me go to the aging brain, where if you uh, do systematic studies with uh, tau immunostaining of various epitopes detecting the pathological forms, you will see neurofibrillary tangles, you will see pretangles, you will see dystrophic neurites, you will see grains which are argyrophilic, and you will see tau immunoreactive astrocytes. Actually, in 2004, Bracken Group reported high prevalence of zone shaped astrocytes in the aged human medial temporal lobe. So, probably this was the first step which started the history of uh, ARTAG, although in previous literature already used the terminology, but not in an aging brain and not in the medial temporal lobe. Like, I mean, the zone shaped astrocyte. Uh, other studies confirmed from different groups like uh, Jacksonville, from UK studies, that indeed in aging brain, there are, med uh, there are astrocytic tau pathology uh, to be detected. Then there were increasing reports of astroglial tau immune reactive pathologies, which were not compatible with well-known entities, which I showed in the first uh, slide. And in 2014, uh, there was a very nice sunny day in Rio de Janeiro, and we were in the co hotel, in a conference, the World uh, Neuropathology Conference, and I had a presentation about uh, cases, and I asked who has seen this, and practically a lot of people put up their hands, and then we decided to go for a consensus study, which in two years appeared as a publication, which is a big challenge with 60 famous co-authors. And we term the tau immune reactive pathology as aging related tau astrogliopathy, ARTAG, as an abbreviation, which aim to describe the morphological spectrum detected by tau immunohistochemistry and was emphasized that it is mainly but not exclusively in <laughs> over 60. Maybe you want to switch off your mind, uh, whoever has. Uh, on. So uh, this is the uh, an image from the publication, which uh, shows the uh, two major morphologies detect detected in the aging brain. One are the zone-shaped astrocytes, and the other one are the so-called granular fuzzy astrocytes. And here above, you see the classical morphologies detected in the well-established uh, tau pathy entities. And then the next level is that these astrocytic tau immune reactive pathologies appear in different locations, and these we call types. So we call sub, uh, subpial, subependymal, white matter, perivascular, and gray matter. Let me have a note on gray matter ARTAG, which shows a spectrum, so it's not always this beautiful granular fuzzy, but the, there is an accumulation in some astrocytes, a kind of a bulky immune reactivity around the nucleus. And these can be also then uh, detected with uh, silver staining and these can show clusters. So in some groups like uh, uh, called this ATAC, which is ATAC, argyrophilic uh, thorn shaped astrocyte clusters. But practically, they can be seen also with, the, with these morphologies. So I think that it's, it's difficult to distinguish them. And it's better to put them as a gray matter R tag itself. And here, this is the Dante gyrus, for example. Just to show you the spectrum, what can appear in the gray matter. So uh, when, when this paper appeared in 2016, we asked whether this can be detected by researchers or not. And it seems that just the pure recognition of the presence of ARTAG is pretty good. So that means that neuropathologists will recognize ARTAG, but not all types. So there might be some differences in the gray matter ARTAG, especially, which still can be mixed with uh, other established uh, tau pathies like PSP or CBD even. And the major problem seems to be that the severity, evaluation of severity still needs some uh, adjustment. 
And I show you an example from a 2017 multi-site uh, paper where we concluded that this traditional semi-quantitative scoring like mild, moderate, severe is difficult because tau in astrocytes appear either focally or widespread. So this is, for example, a numerous widespread. And between the two, these three images, there is about one centimeter in the cortex. So I made a photo here, then move the microscope one centimeter. That's another photo. Move the microscope. That's a photo. So practically, you see along the section uh, uh, the pathologies. And here is another case where you see really here one single occasional one. Another, you move the microscope one centimeter, you see again, you see again. So this means that it is in the whole cortical area, but occasional ones. So now I would like to present the distribution patterns of um, ARTAC types. So when we look through the Philadelphia uh, cohort of longitudinally followed uh, individuals with uh, all kinds of uh, neuropathological diagnosis, we made a summary and this shows that the amygdala is a hotspot for all of the types of the ARTAG. And here in blue colors, you see where we found gray matter ARTAG. Green indicates the white matter, red the subpial, and yellow the subependema. So this is how it distributes in the brain. Now let us look a little bit in details. So the subpial ARTAG, you will detect in the brainstem, only in the brainstem, in about 1.3% of the cases. You will detect only in the basal brain regions in 65% of cases which have ARTAG in their brain. You will detect in about 4% of the cases only in the lobar uh, subpial regions in cases where there is ARTAG in the brain. And then you will see a lot of combinations. In the middle, you see the same uh, bubbles for PSP, where you will see more uh, lobar only supial uh, ARTAG, and especially CBD shows a different pattern. Now let's look at the white matter. In the white matter in AD, contrasting part or other tau diseases, there is a high frequency of only lobar white matter ARTAG. And also only brainstem ARTAG, it reaches the 4%. And how does it distribute in the, in the lobar uh, regions? So in 20% of cases in AD, which have ARTAG, white matter ARTAG, it will be in the temporal. 18% will be in the parietal, nine in the frontal, and so forth. And then here you see the combinations, percentages. So you will see cases where all four uh, lobar regions, uh, the, the above the, these four, will have practically 9% of the cases. Now, what about the gray matter? These bubbles represent the percentages. So gray matter ARTAG, you can detect in part or AD only in the brainstem up to 13%. This means single or more uh, astrocytic immunoreactivity in the substantia nigra, but even the hypoglossal nucleus or particularly the inferior olives frequently shows this. Uh, uh, and here I mean the cases which have any type of ARTAG. So this means that part cases which have ARTAG have 13% only in the brainstem. So not every case with PART have 13% brainstem ARTAG. I say that the cases of PART which have additionally ARTAG, 13% of them have it only in the brainstem. So this is a heat mapping of the different uh, ARTAG uh, types. And as you can see again, uh, the supial, the white matter, and the gray matter predominates in this medial temporal and especially the amygdala region. Now let me try to address the issue of uh, uh, potential pathogenic uh, aspects. 
So we uh, developed or used, applied a conditional probability analysis, heat mapping and uh, logistic regression and for all types of RTAG in a large cohort of cases in the University of Pennsylvania in John Trojanowski's group and published this in 2018. So I just present the conceptual uh, concepts of what we presented. So for the presence of supial RTAG, we recognize two patterns. One, the, according to the model, was initiated in the basal brain regions, including the amygdala and periamygdala um, supial area, followed by either the lobar supial or brainstem dorsolateral parts of the brainstem, and then eventually showing in all regions. The pathophysiology might be associated or closely resembles the cerebrospinal fluid pulsation and circulation, which could suggest a kind of a traffic jam in the basal brain regions, which then locally initiates or contributes to this blood-brain barrier interface uh, or a CSF barrier interface and developing this response from the brain. The other pattern, however, seemed to be initiated in the lobar supial areas, followed by the dorsolateral part of the brainstem, and then to the basal brain regions, which would rather suggest a local inducing factor, such as a mechanical pressure. And if you compare the distribution of RTAG detected in large aging cohorts or various diseases cohorts, there is some overlap between the distribution of CTE uh, associated uh, tau pathology. And in an aging cohort, in a European aging cohort where CTE or, or minor traumatic injury is not frequent or described, there are cases where you find only supial RTAG in the depths of the lobar sulci. And we also found a high frequency of these depths of the sulci tone-shaped astrocytes, for example, in the Guam ALS uh, PDC, Parkinson's disease uh, dementia complex. Which site, and it is, as uh, Anne Mackey mentioned, it is very frequent in CTE, although not pathognomic for CT, but it's very frequent, which means that uh, this pathology we need to find a common uh, pathogenic inducing factor linking these uh, different uh, conditions. And this is just a historical note that even in post-encephalitic Parkinsonism, and I brought this image because we have this COVID stuff again <laughs> to, to talk about. So, you know, this was 100 years ago, these uh, pandemics and then developing uh, this disease after that. And these patients also show supial uh, RTAG. And we are talking that, we, we say that RTAG is an aging, non-specific stuff, but you will detect it also, or this is a case with a 40-year-old male who had a mapped gene duplication, who had exactly, again, RTAG pathology, which for me a little bit suggests that maybe the disbalance or the tau homeostatic effect or even some kind of genetic background can contribute to the presence of RTAG because you will not see RTAG in old aged persons. And as, as you show my, from my case presentation, there will be cases of RTAG when there is nothing in the basal brain regions, but there, are, there is RTAG in other regions of the brain. Now, let me turn to the white matter RTAG, where the patterns also suggest at least two one starting in the amygdala, medial temporal lobe, and then the lobar and the brainstem, and the other one initiated in the lobar white matter. And this is what is probably what we see in the AD cases, where this is really significantly higher than in other uh, disease conditions. Regarding gray matter RTAG, uh, two patterns have been recognized. One is the so-called striatal pattern, and the other one is the amygdala pattern. The striatal pattern means that the gray matter RTAG appears most likely first in the striatum, including the limbic striatum, then in the uh, uh, 
uh, lobar or amygdala, and then progressing to three different patterns, either striatum amygdala and cortex, striatum amygdala or brainstem, or the amygdala path, also an amygdala cortex brainstem pattern. And these distribution patterns follow the astroglia tau immune activity patterns seen in PSP or in CBD. Now, finally, regarding the pathogenesis, there are two markers of astroglial homeostatic uh, function. One is the conexic fo conexin 43, and the other one is the aquaporin 4. And the aquaporin 4, for example, you know from neuromyelitis optica, where it is, there is an antibody against it and causes a damage and a demyelinating disease. But here we see an effect that compared to controls where there is no tau pathology, compared to those which have a lot of uh, tau pathology, the aquaporin and the connexin 43 expression is increased, supporting the concept of a local kind of blood brain or cerebrospinal fluid brain uh, barrier dysfunction, even in the white, deep white matter or cortex. And this leads me to the topic of the relation to FTLD tau proteinopathies. So before that, I would like to return back to the classical concept of uh, tau pathology in neurons. We th or the researchers think that there is a kind of a maturation of tau immune activities in neurons, which means that first it becomes hyperphosphorylated, then there is misfolding and aggregation, and then forms major fibrillar structures detected by silver staining or whatever. And this kind of maturation can be detected in all primary well-known, well-established FTLD tau diseases as well in RTAG. So in all of the disease-specific uh, fibrillar astrocytic inclusions like uh, tufted astrocytes in PSP or astrocytic plaques in CBD or globular glial inclusions in GGT or, or ramified astrocytes in pig's disease, in addition to these, we can find these fine granular, so conceptually interpretable as pre-fibrillar uh, astroglial immunoreactivities. And most importantly, you will find these in brain regions where you don't see neuronal tau. In PSP, CBD, and even Pick's disease, you can see, for example, in the occipital cortex, this type of fine granular astrocytes without uh, associated neuronal tau pathology. And furthermore, we examined AGD, argyrophilic grain cases, and our mathematical model suggested that the presence of these fuzzy astrocytes in the amygdala precede the formation of uh, dendritic uh, grains. So altogether, it seems that these, uh, there is a maturation process, and I show here images again, in PSP CBD, and there is a stage of this maturation which really resembles the granular fuzzy astrocytes which we see in brain regions, gray matter in elderly people without associated classical neuronal accumulation. And this I will return back in the interpretation in my last slides. And this is just an image of a CBD corticobasal degeneration case where you see a typical astrocytic plaque another one, but here you see this astroglial nucleus surrounded by this fine granular immunoreactivity. So this can be summarized and conceptualized that there are scattered phosphotau dots in astrocytes might be a kind of a pre-step for developing different uh, pathognomic astroglial lesions. Now, this leads me to the uh, last topic, which is, or before last, is questioning the clinical relevance. So that is a major aspect of RTAG. Everybody asks, what is the clinical relevance of this? So let me collect some of literature data, and let me be a little bit provo provocative how to interpret this. So this is a study from uh, the group with uh, what I mentioned from UPenn in 2017. So this already showed the multiple regression models that there are certain pathological variables which are associated with more frequency, more uh, with the appearance of RTAC, such as, of course, age, 
but also vascular uh, alterations or ventricular enlargement or even the male gender. There are studies which suggested that this wide matter ARTAG, or as I said, some authors call this ATAG, so uh, ar argyrophilic thorn shaped, uh, thorny astrocyte clusters in Alzheimer's disease. So Munoz et al. Was the were the first to describe this in 2007 and in a primary progressive aphasia with AD pathology. Mesolam and Biggio studies could not confirm this. However, we published that wide matter ARTAG is really significantly associated to AD cases, supported by the paper by Nolan and Greenberg and colleagues from San Francisco and uh, and supporting that art, this type of white matter ARTAG is, uh, is frequently seen in AD, both in typical and atypical cl clinical presentations. And in a recent study from the same group with the first authorship of Rezenda, shows that it seems that the white matter ARTAG in AD is not, a be not so benign as we would, we would have thought previously. So this study shows a negative impact of this pathology to language and possibly visual special networks. And let me show you again an example. This is a 81 year old patient with atypical Parkinsonism. And this shows only brainstem white matter and gray matter ARTAG, no neuronal tau. And we have a collection published in 2011 of cases with an aging cohort with dementia plus minus Parkinsonism, where we saw a lot of astroglia tau pathology and it was, we could not really put into boxes like diagnostic boxes. And we followed up on this aging study and, and, and described different pattern distributions of these. And in my case presentation, I showed you a case and I show it again, and this is now published in a journal that here you see a panel of tau immunoreactivity and this, Lady had only this late onset depression, but had this abundant astroglial tau pathology. And unfortunately, she was not longitudinally followed and not examined systematically. So with this, I want to show you that you are there. You, are, you have these cases, you, you, you have the longitudinal studies. You are the ones who have to find these cases and check better the clinical correlates than in this, than I could do in this uh, single case. And John Toledo uh, made a study on CSF markers in ARTAG, and this was a poster in AIC in Los Angeles last year. And this shows that ARTAG does seem to have an effect on biomarkers, such as uh, the amyloid beta, but also neurogranin, and a higher and neurofilament light chain and also the ratio of neurofilament light chain and amyloid beta is different in cases uh, with uh, ARTAG. So this leads me to uh, the provocative slide, which is a uh, little bit against my personality trait, but let me throw you some thoughts. So a decade ago, if we saw in a microscopy amyloid, some plaques, some tangles, cognitively normal individual, we would say, ah, it's no clinical relevance. Today, we call these preclinical cases. Also, there are some cases with astrocytic plaques, four at positive neurons, neurologically normal individuals, looks like a CBD. And now we call this as preclinical CBD, see a brain article by Ling and a cohort of these incidental CBD cases. Also, if you see uh, MSA, oligodendroglial inclusions in the cerebellum in a neurological normal individual, you would call it MSA, and you get excited that you found the first earliest vulnerable region, but there is no exact clinical correlate for that. You, the patient might not have a cerebellar ataxia, and there are these incidental cases out there. Or if you see a single brain infarct in a silent anatomical region, you would say that it doesn't have direct clinical relevance, but it would indicate for you that this person has a disease affecting vessels, and if he or she wouldn't die, there would be more in the future. 
So before we want to understand the clinical relevance, let's define clinical relevance. Do you want me to show you ARTA cases with clear cut dementia, nothing else? Or you want to think about ARTA or this widespread distribution as a kind of a precondition and because we haven't yet evaluated enough cases with longitudinal follow-up, we, we will not know at this moment what these individuals will show in a couple of years. Or you want to define clinical relevance also including the biomarker effect or even an MRI effect, which I, I cannot bring you example, but just to open up the thinking out of the box. So maybe it has effect on the CSF biomarkers and you have beautiful studies but they're outliers, you cannot really come up with the concept. And maybe these outliers have additional attack, but because nobody included in these biomarker studies, nobody evaluated it, we cannot conclude on that. So the evaluation strategies, and this is from the paper. And I know that the detailed mapping cannot be performed in the diagnostic procedure. A lot of time, a lot of cost, a lot of funding needed. But still, I think it should be documented and if you have capacity and money, should be done in a detailed research setting. But at least as an orientation, it should be provided whether there is RTAG type or it should be documented where, whether any type of RTAG is uh, present and eventually the major anatomical involvement. Now, a couple of weeks ago, there was a discussion what to include in the screening for the NAC uh, centers. And this was the four regions, the amygdala frontal, basal ganglia, and basal parts of the brain, medulla oblongata. Now, let's see what would be the rationale to include this. So the amygdala is, I said, it's a hotspot. So the bonus is that if you stay in tau, you will also detect more AGD, early AGD, than you do now. The remark is that 10% chance, up to 10% chance that the ARTAG is present in other regions, but not in amygdala. If you stay in the frontal for tau, the rationale behind that is that you can detect supial depth of the suit seat tone-shaped astrocytes, white matter tone-shaped astrocytes, or occasional gray matter granular fuzzy astrocytes. But I have a remark that white matter ARTAG is more prevalent in the temporal and the parietal lobe in AD, but fortunately, most likely, you will stay in the temporal lobe also for tau, so you will detect this spectrum. Now, the rationale for staining the basal ganglia would be to detect gray matter ARTAG, especially in limbic uh, striatum like uh, nucleus accumbens. The bonus would be that the section usually contains the basal brain area, so you have a more, more uh, option to, to find uh, supial ARTAG also in the basal brain regions. And eventually the bonus is that you will detect early forms of PSP. And what do you miss if you don't stain basal ganglia? Practically, you will miss these subcortical gray matter uh, ARTAG cases, which I showed you some examples. If you stain the medulla oblongata, that would be relevance of detecting ARTAG when it is only in the brainstem. And if you don't stain medulla oblongata, then about, you have to know that about 10% of your cohort will show ARTAG only in the brainstem. So you will miss these cases. So finally, my provocative thoughts for cost calculation is that you will not be able to interpret the relevance of ARTAG or eventually, eventual concomitant FTLD tau in early stages with a conservative approach. You can wait for research studies. And I know that most of you call ARTAG as a non-specific alteration. I, I don't want to convince you of anything here. It's too immature situation. But let me repeat, there are individuals with a lot and there are age individuals with no ARTAG. So what is the reason that some individuals have a lot ARTAG? And what is the reason that they have some kind of symptoms, some of them? So what do you want to say in five years? Oh, it's a pity we did not stay in more regions. We have to start all the study again. Or you want to say, great, we stay in many regions. We are sure ARTAG doesn't have any relevance or it has relevance or has biomarker effect. It's your decision, not mine. 
So the take home message is RTAG is a very frequent pathology in aging, but can be seen in younger individuals also as part also, and we call it primary age related topathy, but we see it in younger. Uh, for example, perivascular RTAG is not seen in all cases with small vessel disease, so it suggests that there is a reason that some patients have it. If you talk about clinical relevance, define what you mean by clinical relevance. Don't talk about RTAG. Talk about stratification of types of RTAG. I don't expect that supial RTAG will cause clinical symptoms, but it might have a change in the biomarker results, especially that it most likely reflects a pathological response to a blood-brain barrier dysfunction. Or the gray and white matter RTAG will be probably different clinical associate as a supial RTAG. So that's why don't say RTAG has a clinical relevance, say does gray matter RTAG has clinical relevance. What is the relevance of supial RTAG? Don't say does RTAC has clinical relevance? So as I told you, there is a difficulty in evaluation of severity. So maybe here a digital approach, and I saw that you have excellent teams working on digital approaches. So I think that this could be considered to kind of get a more harmonized uh, strategy. And let me tell you that until you see a case with widespread gray matter RTAC, you won't believe it exists. That's a case what I showed you. And my experience visiting a lot of different centers in the world, that the spectrum of tau pathologies, including RTAG, will be different in your cohorts. It depends on where you get the cases from. In an aging community-based study, you will see as I, my experience, completely different patterns than if you get the cases from a early onset Alzheimer's center so that is my final conclusion, and thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kovach, for a wonderful talk about a really interesting pathology. I have to just say, interject myself real quick between you two, that this is a pathology we're seeing in definitely over half of our cases. It's a, it looks like it's doing stuff. It, I don't think that, I don't believe that it's, there's a magic where you can look like you have a very messed up brain and have it not be impactful. We just haven't been able to do the clinical pathological association studies that we need to do. And hopefully this is going to get us on our route to start doing it. There's an old, this is a political era in our, in our country uh, for better, for worse. And one of the political adages is if you want a whole uh, cake and uh somebody only gives you half a cake, take the half a cake and you can get the rest of the cake later. So as of now, we're doing uh, two of the regions and Dr. McKee is going to tell us and introduce us to the new data entry elements that are present and scorable related to our tag. And this was, I think it's really important to, to notice this, that these are two of the world's super duper experts in this field. Some people say that there's some overlap between RTAG and CTE. And here we have, the, I think, the true blue world experts in RTAG and CTE who came together to discuss a way that we could enter this data in a way that would enable us to um, uh, store it for ourselves and to share it between each other. And I think, um, I think it's very exciting. So Dr. McKee, please take it away. Well, thanks, Pete. Thanks for um, um, calling me a super duper expert. Um, but I am going to talk about a aging related tau astrogliopathy or RTAG in our NAC forms. And Pete's right, we originally suggested that we look at four regions, and now we have reduced it to two regions the frontal and amygdala. And, and one uh, first, I want to mention right away that I'm, I'm with Gabor that there's something to this RTAG. And I, you know, we see it in CTE all the time. We see it, the, the subfield in 20 years. So there's something going on there. Um, so the, as far as the NAC form, the very first question in 18 is, is it present? Is it present or not? And this is considering all the slides that you typically uh, stain for tau, this varies by center. In your opinion, after looking at all the tau based slide, tau stain slides, is RTAG present? And if it's not assessed or missing, 
the whole thing collapses though. So you have to, that's, that's the only question you would have to answer. If, if you wanna say not assessed, that's the last, the first and last Arteg question. Um, if there is uh, some Arteg pathology present, uh, then uh, based on just the frontal cortex or the amygdala, uh, you are, we are asked to rate the overall severity of Arteg pathology. Now, I personally think this is fairly difficult. Um, as, 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 as Gabor pointed out, it tends to be focal and dispersed, and it's very hard to sort of wrap your head around a, whether or not that's mild, moderate, or severe. I do think um, that uh, the, the, some of the uh, montages that Gabor provided in his uh, articles are, are helpful in this, in this manner, but this is provide a semi-quantitative assessment of overall RTEG pathology as identified using tau stains um, in the frontal cortex and the amygdala, either as mild, moderate, or severe. And this is uh, the montage from the multi-site assessment of RTEG. I think it's useful uh, with some ideas of what we would score a three, what we would score uh, moderate or two, and uh, a score of one, the occasional focal uh, cluster of, of astrocytes. Um, once you have identified our tag pathology in the amygdala with a yes answer, uh, then you will be asked uh, to further localize uh, the tau pathology and, uh, and decide whether it's focal or widespread. And so some of these pathologies you've seen uh, with Dr. Kovach's wonderful talk, but I'll just show you some of his images that he gave me. Uh, so you're going to say whether it's perivascular, you're gonna say whether it's affecting uh, the gray matter, you're gonna say whether it's affecting the white matter, and it can be perivascular in the white matter or the gray. Uh, it can be subependymal, it can be subpeal, uh, and all of those things you're going to rate, either focal or widespread. And then the next thing that you're gonna look at is the tau immunostain uh, frontal section, usually mid frontal. And again, you're gonna look for those same things with the, ex with the exception of the subependymal arteg won't be present on that block. You're gonna look for subpeel, gray matter, white matter, perivascular. These are not a mutually exclusive categories. Some white matter is perivascular as a, as a as I previously showed, and you're gonna decide whether it's focal or widespread. And so here's some examples of frontal cortex gray matter, RTAG pathology, that's also perivascular. Uh, here's uh, granular fuzzy astrocytes in the frontal cortex. Here's uh, examples of white matter, uh, also white matter with perivascular, uh, 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 accentuation of the pathology. And, and thank you very much, Gabor. Again, all of these images are from him. I was going crazy trying to find it in our collection because they're not well characterized and it was taking me forever. And all I did was ask Gabor and he, he immediately sent me these images, which totally saved my life. Um, here's an image though from our center. Uh, we have a lot of uh, sub peel TSA. This is an image from Russ Huber. This is what we see all the time. I will point out that this amount of perivascular sub peel pathology would not be considered uh, CTE. This is this would not uh, constitute a, a pathognomonic lesion of CTE or perivascular lesion. These are those superficial uh, uh, regions that we don't include in the pathognomonic lesion. And that's that's it. It's a pretty pretty uh, self. It's pretty straightforward, it's pretty simple, and if you don't have any RTAG in your case, it collapses into nothing. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. McKee. And um, so, so we have come to uh, this, this point and uh, we're sort of past the time when we're supposed to adjourn. Um, and so I would totally understand it if people wanted to break out. Uh, Dr. McKee, that was a really wonderful um, uh, presentation to describe what we're going to be assessing, though, from now on for NAC. Um, as you say, that if, if you say that you didn't assess it, you could just hit that button and then that pretty much wraps it up. But I, I, I think that 
um, um, Dr. Kovach made a pretty good case that we should try to do a clinical pathological correlation if we can um, and to build that uh, as part of, of what we do. Um, the, I have a, a question for both um, uh, Ann and Gabor here uh, related to how late and CTE are going to be um, parsed out and, and um, and my, my question is as vague as maybe as we all are wondering about what these, how these things interact and how do you think that in five years we're going to be looking at them different? And so maybe I'll ask you first, Ann, because you were just talking, what, what, how do you think CTE and, and um, our tag are going to be differentiated in five or 10 years maybe? Well, I think, you know, that's what we're trying to do with these consensus panels. We're really, uh, originally when we first, uh, when we first were looking at CTE, we saw so much RTAG that we thought it was part of the CTE lesions, but I think we've been able to drill that down and, and parse it out. And we now are characterizing what we consider to be the essential CTE lesions. And, and then, and then the other, uh, and then the other lesions that would be called RTAG. Um, uh, I'm not sure how much further we'll get with that, quite honestly. But I, but the fact that the fact that we see uh, the RTAG or the, the subpeel TSA, the, the thorn-shaped astrocytes in 20 20 year olds, 25 year olds with CTE, only about a quarter of the time, but we still see it. Um, that says to me that there is something pathologically going on. I'm not sure what it is. I think it's intriguing that connexin and alpha alcoporin are, 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 are markers of the astrocytes. I personally think it has to do something with the clearance problem in those regions that somehow the glymphatic clearance is, is, is blocked and that's why you're uh, piling up in astrocytes, but that's just my, my guess. Thank you very much. Gabor? Thank you. I, I, I cannot really add to Anne's wonderful thoughts. I also think that <clears throat> the superior depth of the Sulci astrocytes in CT, in aging, in other diseases like Guam or even postencephalitic, it just really shows that they have some common points and alone they will not, not support a pathognomic CT diagnosis, but it seems it's so frequent in CTE. So we just have to really find a link. And, and I think that Anne is telling all the thoughts, including the lymphatic system or a local reaction. So let me follow up then to get you back on the crystal ball uh, business here, uh, Gabor, is that you are, it would be maybe better if we could collect more data, but this is the data that we're going to be collecting for the time. Uh, given that we're going to be looking pretty carefully at the amygdala and at the frontal sections and, and scoring them, what do you think the prospects are of us finding clinical pathological correlation there? Do you think that, there, that do you think it's futile because it's going to be inadequate, or do you think that there's at least a chance that we could get in on um, this association? I think that if you examine only these two, you will not get a clear-cut clinical pathological correlate. What you can do or what you can achieve is that you will find cases and when you see a lot of uh, astroglial only in the, I mean, only astroglial in the amygdala, but a lot, then you will think, okay, it's better if I stay in a lot of regions for Tau. But only that you see something in the amygdala, this will, I'm not sure that this will bring you up with a beautiful clinical pathologic or whatever. Fair enough. Uh, Dennis Dixon, let me, let me shine the spotlight on you and ask a similar set of questions. Uh, you are, are obviously a, a huge expert too. Uh, I would say super duper expert, as Anne loves to be called, uh, in, in this re the region of uh, glial tauopathies. And how do you think these things interrelate? And what what do you think the prospects are for clinical pathological correlation in our tag? I think they're dis they're dismal, quite frankly. Um, if you think about the tau uh, the tauopathies, it's mostly driven by neuronal pathology. It's not astrocytic. So if there's, uh, if you see RTAG in the setting of some neuronal tau, then the, probably the neuronal tau is driving it. I don't think, and Gabor can address this, what's the frequency of pure astroglial tauopathy? I don't think it exists. 
I think if you've got astroglial, and, and the same thing for CTE, and this is why the CTE criteria say neuronal and astrocytic or, or, and or astrocytic, but astrocyte, astrocyte alone, very unlikely. I mean, there, maybe there are some disorders, primary disorders of astrocytes, um, where you, but the pathology is in the white matter. You get a, you know, a leukoencephalopathy. Um, so, you know, with Rosenthal fiber encephalopathy, but um, I, I'm very skeptical that there's much clinical correlate with astrocytic pathology. So, I mean, it's a really interesting thing that one sees a lot of times people that get their heads bashed repetitively and they get this sort of reactive tauopathy and then it verbalates for several decades and then it sort of seems to translate into a progressive degenerative change that incorporates neuronal changes. Um, and so, but on the other hand, we do, we in our old people are seeing, seeing a fair number of uh, cases that have what looks like an impactful degree of, of our tag and, and like it's still an open question. So uh, Dennis, thank you. Do you have anything to add to that? Oh, only that um, when does reactive astrocytosis uh, become tau positive and, or could it? In which case it's, it's a reactive process to something else. So is there neuronal injury? Is there synaptic injury? Is there uh, myelin or axonal pathology in that region? And then you get an astrocytic reaction. Then for some reason, be it maybe the genetic background of the individual or, or whatever it might be, the astrocytes are more prone to accumulate tau. But I would be more interested in trying to understand what is the substrate for the, the underlying lesion that led to that tau astrocyte. Um, and unless you can show, because, you know, tau is not a very abundant protein in astrocytes normally. And I don't even know if, do we know, are, is this tau that the astrocytes made or is it tau that the astrocytes took up? And I, so there are many questions and, uh, and I don't know, I mean, I, I, I personally, I, I hope that, you know, Gabor is going to be the one to find the answer to these questions. Well, it looks like Dr. McKee has unclicked her mute button and so we're... Because I actually, the one thing about RTEG that's always struck me, and it's because it was so prominent in the first few cases of CT that I saw, which were, you know, older boxers. Um, I always thought it was a C, it had to do a CSF flow. That was the explanation why it was around vessels. It's around, you know, the base of the brain. Uh, that, that maybe there was a lot of tau in the CSF and the astrocytes were, were sucking it up somehow. Or, anyway, that was, that was what it looked like to me. That's what it, um, that was, those were my thoughts, but I've never been able to go any further than that. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. McKee. Oh, Gabor, you look raring to go there. I mean, really 10 seconds response to Danny's comment. So, let me, again, we have to return back to the stratification. So as I say, a super PLR tag, I don't think so that you ever cause any symptoms, but might have a biomarker relevance. White matter tag, as San Francisco group shows, might be not so benign as we think, but according and true, what correct what Dennis says, that it is in a white matter, axonal, anything can happen. So we can accept that it contributes maybe. Gray matter tag it will be practically impossible to detect brains only with astroglial because obviously this is an aging case. So you will find some neuronal tau in all of these cases. So in a human studies, it's impossible. But what I showed you that there are regions which have only astroglial tau, my concept would be that this represents that there is a neuronal dysfunction going on there. The astrocytes try to cope with the situation and then maybe five years later, a couple of years later, the neuronal tau appears. And even in Pick's disease, the occipital cortex, you have it. In the areas projecting to the occipital lobe have neuronal tau. So it might be also, if you like the propagation of tau concept, that the tau arrives with the uh, neuri neurites, so the neuronal process. The local astrocyte tries to take it up at a certain point cannot cope with it and the local neuronal tau will appear. So that could be also a conceptual approach. So that was just an ad hoc response. Very cool. Um, there's a cool 
question in the hopper by Dr. Tom Beach, but first I want to ask Bill Seeley a question here. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting about your approach with the TDP43 uh, is using uh, non-phospho antibody, which enables you to see some things. There's a little bit of a different sensitivity, but it also allows you, allows you to see some aspects of TDP43 pathochemistry that you are, is not able to be seen with the phospho. Uh, and this segues into sort of a question of how some of these reactive changes are seen uh, and, and how that you would call it late or FTLD or whatever, once you say a boxer in, in, in Dr. McKee's uh, set is 50 years old and he has a bunch of TDP, do you call it late? Do you call it FTLD? Do you call it CTE? Have you, could you give your perspective on some of the things that you've seen with your non-phosphorylated antibodies that could um, uh, be interesting to us folks that are more reliant on the phospho ones, please? Sure, I mean, I can speak to my experience um, looking at FTLD TDP cases with that antibody. And I think that the sensitivity kind of depends on what you're used to. So for me, my eyes are drawn to the clearing of the nucleus that I see only when I use the, the pan TDP antibody. And sometimes even at low power, you can see that before those very fine inclusions uh, reach your eyes. And so I think the sensitivity is sort of in the eye of the beholder, but um, obviously with a, a phospho-specific antibody, you'll never see that loss of the nuclear TDP. And in patients with FTLD TDP, and I have to say we've studied this primarily in uh, the type B cases like the ones I showed today, um, we do see a stage in which um, there's a loss of the nuclear TDP without any apparent cytoplasmic inclusion. And um, we think that's consequential for the cells. We did a study a couple of years ago led by Alyssa Nanalit and published an act in our path where uh, we showed that those cells lacking the nuclear TDP were just as sort of degenerate as the ones with a, a fully formed inclusion. Um, and this seems to be an early stage thing. So in patients with pure clinical ALS who are just starting to have FTD-like symptoms or even don't have those symptoms, but uh, have a few inclusions in the FTD areas, you might see uh, even more of those sort of nuclear depleted neurons. And, uh, so we think it's a really interesting um, phenomenon to sort of pursue. And it's particularly prominent in FTLD TDP um, type B cases that have an underlying C9 mutation. Um, so that's, that's another little wrinkle to this that we're trying to understand. CTE, do you see it with CTE? I don't have enough experience to say, but I would, I would just um, love to kind of work with Ann and use this, Ann, this I'm sure you're probably mo mostly using phospho TDP antibodies like most people, but um, if you're not, or if you'd like to kind of <laughs> take a look, and we, we're building um, you know, computational probes to be able to go and find those dec depleted nuclei that lack a, a, uh, an inclusion, so it would be fun to sort of team up on that. Cool. Yeah, definitely. I, I just would say that in the beginning, we, we did use non-phospho TDP, and we were seeing TDP abnormalities in much younger people than we see in uh, phospho tau, but that's just anecdotal. But uh, I was seeing it sometimes in, in the really young folks. So that you, there cool. might be something interesting. It's so neat that people associate that with a more sensitive uh, probe, but you're saying that it's more sensitive to use the non-phospho. Well, it, it's, um, it's sensitive in the sense that you can see an earlier stage of neuronal change, of neuro TDP pathobiology. And then it's also, I think, I find it helpful to, to sort of lead my eyes toward the, the inclusion bearing cells because that blue nucleus just jumps off the, the page if you look at a, enough of these. Yeah. That's cool. All right, uh, uh, another question uh, for Gabor, uh, and you may have already answered it, but I'm interested in your answer is that sometimes you see in the subpeal region, uh, a bunch of RTAG, um, but not just RTAG, also uh, with tauopathy, but with TDP and other things, uh, they're sort of surrounding and, is, and wrapping these corpora amylacea. Do you, what do you think about that observation? Thank you. So, <clears throat> yes, I, I agree with this. I made a systematic study. I did not publish this. I made it with a student. Uh, it does not always, so it can be independent, but indeed it's frequently is associated. I think it again shows that there are, there, is, there are some individuals who develop it and individuals who don't develop it, even if they, there is the corpora amylacea. And the corpora amylacea just shows me again that there is a 
barrier dysfunction because that was also raised for a concept for for the formation. Thank you very kindly. Um, uh, Dr. Dixon, uh, combining questions by Doug Galasco and Larry Walker, um, what do you think about astrocytes dysfunction um, and w when they have tau in them and uh, whether or not animal models can uh, uh, sort of mechanistically really give a, a good modeling for these um, pathologies? Well, I think that, that they're getting at the issue. If, if you can get an animal model where you can have a pure um, tau pathology in astrocytes, I mean, it's going to be artificial, but if you can drive tau expression to the point where you can actually get aggregates in astrocytes, and then you have methods to actually assess some of the outcomes in terms of the normal astrocyte function, then I think you'll, you'll be moving along the trajectory of getting an answer to the significance of tau in astrocytes that we see in the aged brain. But I mean, it's, I think it's similar to corporate amylacea. I mean, nobody, I don't think, thinks that corporate amylacea have a major impact in terms of cognitive or behavioral dysfunction. And yet it's a pervasive type of astrocytic pathology that occurs as part of aging. What, so what's different about uh, polyglucosan bodies as opposed to um, phospho tau? Well, one thing is that some are extracellular, some are intracellular. And I think you can make a pretty good argument that our ignoring of corpora amylacea may be um, eventually re-examined at some point, but I agree with you that the point's well taken. Uh, separate question then coming in from the Trojster. Hello, John Trojanowski. He asks about Alexander's disease, which is a disease that is a astrocytes have too much GFAP. Um, he and his lab folks have shown that there's TDP43 proteinopathy in uh, some of these cases, even in young people. Uh, what do you think about RTAG and Alexander's disease? Is for you, Gabor. I answered it in text that unfortunately I haven't yet examined Alexander. Oh, okay. Anybody uh, who has, it's a right great right idea. Should, should be done, should be done. That's an interesting question. All right, well, we're already kind of a half hour or so late. I don't want to keep you all the panels. I, I'm really honored to be um, with a panel of this uh, august nature. Thank you very much to, for your time. I don't want to abuse it. Um, thanks to all that stuck around, 127 of you. Uh, much appreciated. I hope that it was um, interesting for you as it was for me. Um, Anne, Gabor, Dennis, Bill, Liana had to go. She was on a red eye to, in, in Europe and she, she needed to, to go, but I appreciate her very much as well. Thank you all very much for a really interesting talk. And just one more thing, the results of the poll was only for the neuropathologists. Over, well over 90% thought that it was very important to have our neuropathological diagnoses standardized. We always say we're the gold standard but we always think of it, the gold is the important thing because we are the ones that are the reference point. But it's the standard, I think, that really makes us even more important so that people can over here to have the same diagnosis as over there. And so I think that this is, these conversations are really important to get that standardization, which makes our diagnostic uh, practices more meaningful. So thank you all very much. Uh, welcome, Andy uh, Tyke. Thanks again, Andy Lieberman. And we uh, are done for the year. Thank you so much, y'all. Thank you, Pete. Thank you for organizing, Peter. Thank you for the organization.